Today, I want to talk about cracking the contractor code. This is probably one of my favorite topics. Uh, in the business of house flipping, you, all the money you make is going to be very directly related to how well you can handle contractors and you understand that piece of the business. For many years, there's a lot of gurus who taught me and said, Mike, you, you, know, you don't need to be a contractor. Just hire someone to do that for you. And uh, I never was able to get great results until I completely went against that advice and made some quick changes. And I'm going to share with you today exactly what I'm doing, what's been working with me for me over the years. And I'm going to share the simple five-step process I use to estimate repairs quickly uh, and hire rock star contractors so I can finish quickly and on budget. Because see, this is really the key. If you can finish your house as quick clean on budget house flipping is going to be a lot of fun for you but if you are struggling and fighting all the way it is not going to be so much fun in my experience unless you just like you know you like being beat up and you like having that some people love that in that case i would not follow my process because this will make things a lot easier so if you do enjoy the excitement of you know always chasing people around and fighting well then you know just keep doing what you're doing because you don't want to make improvements but I kind of got tired of that very quickly. And I was willing to do it in the beginning because obviously I would do anything to be in the house flipping. And it had been my dream for a really long time. So I, you know, I would do whatever is necessary to win. And, and I think most people on this webinar is willing to do whatever it takes to win. We're going to talk about the day as the, the way to make it easy so you can win more often. So let's go through and we'll make sure we keep doing. One second, let me hit their next slide. Uh, before we jump in, make sure that everyone turns off any advice. I make sure it's quiet. We're going to go through some really good content, so I don't want you to miss anything. Uh, if you got an ability to take some notes and you know, make sure your phone's off, I just turn mine off because I know random people like to call me, telemarketers and you know, family members, so I turn my phone off. So I would turn yours off too and get a notepad and uh, anything cool that you want to see. Great. And at the end, I'm going to give everyone access to the slides of this video. So there's going to be some really high level stuff in here. And we got some cool stuff at the end. I'm also going to give us a gift. I'll show you that in a second. You're in the right place. And I just want to qualify that. It looks like everyone here is house flipping. So if you're a professional house flipper, you're in the right place. Or if you're looking to get in the game, let's say you haven't done a house yet, but you want to do it right when you finally invest money to do it, then this is the right place to be. Because I'm going to show you a process that has been really the linchpin of my success in house flipping. It's been all about working with contractors, being able to understand their moves and how to counteract those moves so that I can be successful and have good quality results and, uh, and not go crazy along the way. So you're also in the right place if you're tired of fighting with contractors about price because you don't have a process to estimate repairs. Uh, early on, I realized you know, trying to get them to estimate repairs is kind of a nightmare. You know, they're all over the place. They Sometimes they'll give you an estimate, then, then a month later, they'll give you a whole different estimate. So it's really, I've had to figure out how to estimate my own repair so I can walk in a house. When it's a deal, I want to walk in and I want to lock it up as quick as possible. And if you're done dealing with the frustration of contractors who never finish on time or on budget, well, we're all in the same boat. I will say welcome to the family if that's the case, because uh, I'm done with that. I imagine a lot of people are. Some people deal with it their whole lives in house slipping. And I can promise you, if you continue to deal with people who never keep their promises, they just never get done on time, it'll eventually burn you out. And I have to be honest, I mean, just coming from my heart, that's one of my biggest fears. I love house flipping. Uh, I don't think I have a lot of other better opportunities out there than house flipping. So I really am, it's, it's very important for me to make this business easy enough that I can do it till until I'm old and senile, you know, I want to do this for the rest of my life and, uh, and I'm hoping I'll have that opportunity. So everything I teach you is about how to do it easily, simply, and the systems that have worked for me over the years. So, and there's obviously at any point you have any questions, feel free to say, Hey Mike, what's up with that? And I'll do my best to answer you. If I don't get right to you, I'll make sure I do as soon as I can. So just know sometimes I, I get on a roll and I, you know, getting some good stuff and I might not get back with a second, but I'll do my best and we'll hit it to Q&A if not. Also, you're in the right place if you want an easy proven system to estimate repairs, hire rock star contractors and finish your flips quickly. Um, you're in the right place. I'm going to share with you some really good stuff that has really changed my life and allowed me to go from working way too many hours to having the freedom that I had always envisioned having when I got into this business. Because when I first got in, I, you know, I'd only watch late night infomercials that, you know, showed me a bunch of Ferraris and hot blondes 
lawns and mansions and stuff like that. And that's what I thought, you know, real estate investing was. In the reality, I found out real estate, just like anything else, it's a job. You got to work hard at it. You have to get good at your discipline and you have to understand what you're doing and you have to become good at this. You can't, there's no free money, nothing, no, you know, dollars falling out of the sky. You have to put some work in. What I love about this business, however, is that if you get better at that work, you build your systems out, you get great at the things that really matter, which is finding great deals and hiring great people, then this all gets a lot easier. All right. And you start, you know, working a lot of less hours and getting way better results. And we'll talk a lot about that shortly. And it doesn't really matter where you are in your, you know, flipping journey, whether you're new, you've been doing this a while, there's going to be something here to help you make more profits because I'm really going to teach you some high level stuff. Exactly what I do in my business. It's not a guru program at the end of this uh, training. I'm not going to be like, Hey, you can buy, a, you know, a special program for 39 bucks. There's not going to be any of that. I'm really just going to be all content. We're going to get into some very high level concepts, believe you know, different myths, different things that are probably holding you back and stopping you from getting the results that you truly want. So I'll make sure we share all those out with you tonight. Now let's go over our game plan so that we can focus on that. Uh, first, uh, we want to review a simple process to estimate repairs, hire rockstar contractors and finish your flips quickly. So that process is a five step process I've been using for the last few years and it's really changed the game for me. And I'm going to break it down in high level detail for you. I'm also going to show you how I use standardized pricing so I can walk through a house and create exact estimate repairs, uh, repair estimates in like minutes. You know, instead of sitting in a house all day, getting multiple estimates, negotiating, I walk through and I create all my own stuff quickly so that I know within 15, 20 minutes what I can buy a house for and how much it's going to cost me to do the renovation. I'm also going to share with you my three-step process that I use to hire rock star contractors and know when, you know, when they're criminals and when they're not cool and they're people that make, you know, are slimy and not so fun to work with. And, um, you know, and I just want to work with good people. Now, I also want to make sure they're affordable, fast, and reliable. And a lot of times people laugh when they hear that. They're like, is there such a thing as a contractor that's affordable, fast, and reliable? Yes, there is. There's a lot of people out there that want a contract. They're good people. They're fast at what they do. Um, they're able to work with your pricing because that's what makes them affordable because they're efficient. Now, through my years, I realized that, you know, one guy could take three days to do a roof and, and another guy could take a day and a half. And the person that takes a day and a half often will be more affordable due to the fact that he's charging you for roughly a day and a half's work versus the other person thinking that it's a three day job. So when people are more efficient, then they become more affordable and they become more reliable because they're happy to work for you. I'm also going to tell you how I weed out shady contractors and uh, that is going to save you thousands of dollars and never ending headaches to come with it. And then when we're done all that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the next steps to make it happen. So we can jump right into that. Uh, the gift that I have for you at the end, some of you guys heard this, some of you haven't because I don't, I don't think I told everyone what this is, but I have a contractor pricing cheat sheet. Now this is how I standardize my pricing so that I don't have to go through and ask people what things cost. Now, there's some stuff in here. This won't be the price of everything in the world, but it's going to be the price of a lot of the big things that matter and some of the stuff that's really going to help you be able to walk through a house. And instead of getting estimates, I want you to be able to use this price sheet to know, okay, a window costs this much, a door costs this much, trim costs this much, towel costs this much. And you're going to see all that in this gift that I have. So if you stay to the end, I'm going to make sure you have this is only my only provide this to my students. Um, you know, I, I used to sell it for $199. I've actually taken it down. So it's really something you'll get the day for attending and hanging out with us and being cool and uh, being, you know, it'll be great stuff. I'm just excited for you to have it. Uh, so Delante actually convinced me to do it. Who works with me is like, give them something big, give them something great. And I said, you know what? You pick it. What is the greatest thing everyone loves? And Delante was like, they all love this. And I was like, no, not that. I can't give that away. That's my secret weapon. He's like, yep, you said anything. I was like, you got me, man. Let's do it. So um, you guys get that tonight. And I'm very happy. And Dave, I hope you're using it tomorrow, man. It's going to be good stuff. And I'm happy to have that for you. And I know you're going to love it. And I will have to get some feedback from you after the fact. You know, let me know how much you like it or if you don't like it or you think there's some things that need to be improved. Because part of anything being great is it being open to feedback, right? We want to be able to improve it over time, make it better. So feel free to give me any feedback through email, however you like, on a groups, anything you, you know you want from that. I'd love to hang out and talk to you more about it. Some of the biggest value you're going to get from our training today is the Q&A session at the end. So you're going to get an opportunity to engage with me. I've done over 1,100 flips at this point, and I really am a student of this game. And you know, even though a lot of people would have considered me to be a successful flipper many, many years ago, I still worked with three coaches at the time. I still spent a lot 
lot of time, you know, working on things, making my life better, you know, just everything. I believe that we don't become great flippers. We're always on the journey to just mastery. So this is a never ending thing. So at the end, I'm going to really feel, I just want to share with you some stuff that's going to be very systematic. It's going to be the details of how I do things, very transparent. You're going to get exactly what you need. So if you have a question that you think is a great question, you would really like to get answered, revolved around this subject at the end, feel free to answer that question or ask that question and I'll give you an answer to the best of my ability. The good news is, since I'm a student of the game, I often have answers. If I do not have an answer, just in case that happens, I will get back with you because I am very careful to make sure I give you a good answer. If there's something I don't believe that I know enough about, then I'll make, I'll do it, make my best to go out, figure it out, ask some other experts, bring some of my team around and really get you the right answer for that. Okay. So that's my promise I make to you. You stay to the end and we're going to give you a lot of value on the Q and a, um, to tell you a little bit about me, for you guys who don't know me, I started flipping in 2009, and I had always dreamed of being a house flipper. I grew up poor in the projects. I got in a lot of trouble as a teenager, and I didn't exactly have the perfect life. I definitely wasn't vo voted most likely to secede. I think I was probably voted most likely to be in prison before I got out of jail, which ended up being a real thing, so I don't know how they knew. And I got in so much trouble because I was such a bad kid. I didn't have a father around. I didn't have a role model. And where I lived at in the projects, no one was good, so everyone kind of was just bad and I didn't have a lot of positive people around me. Um, my life changed when I started reading books like, you know, Think and Grow Rich. And I started realizing there's so much positivity in the world. And there's so many amazing things. And, and I legitimately was able to take and change my life and go from negative to positive, you know, start my own business, doing flooring and, you know, working a nine to five, which I never loved, but it was way better than, you know, being a goofball that I was as a teenager. And uh, honestly, I was just being more productive for the world, for my family, for myself self and very, very happy to do that. When I got into flipping, finally, when I took the big dive, because I'm a very analytical person, so I didn't just jump right into flipping. I read books for like six years and watched Flip This House and YouTube videos, anything you can imagine. And honestly, I never would have got started. I met a friend who I played poker with. He was a complete crazy person. He's like, I'm going to flip a house because I thought about it yesterday. And I'm like, I've been thinking about it for six years and I'm not ready to do it. But he's like, I'm doing it and I have the money. Do you want to do it with me? And I'm like, no, not really. And eventually he kept working on me and he made me take action, right? For so long, I wanted to do it. And without him, I never would have done my first flip. So I'm very, you know, giving a big thank you. Appreciate that, Chris. He was my buddy, Chris. And um, he ended up being just as crazy as a partner. So we only did one house together because he was kind of a maniac. And, and honestly, he just, I'm so glad that he pushed me into this because without him, I never would have got past my fear of doing the first house. Once I did my first house, I realized all those books I'd read and a lot of stuff I'd learned. And what I learned on my first flip um, really came in handy to me. It gave me an opportunity to go out and learn, get better at this and just keep improving. So from there, I've been able to do so much stuff and, and we used a GC on our first flip. And now, obviously, you're going to know that I don't really support GCs because I don't love giving the control away of someone else, you know, taking my flip and taking my money. And then I'm hoping they do a great job uh, because my business has revolved around this one person. Naturally, I'm sure you've heard this story before, but we've been we went way over budget, way over timeline. The GC made a lot of promises, um, really just didn't do anything they said they would do, which kind of sucked. And I found that is my thing that drives me crazy. We all have that thing that drives them crazy. Well, thing that drives me crazy and I don't know where this comes from, but when someone gives me a promise and they don't keep it, it makes me lose my mind. Now, I'm very reasonable these days, but with contractors, it seems like something I was dealing with every day, sometimes multiple times a day. They just couldn't keep a promise on anything. So I realized that's my weak spot. It's the thing that kind of like, you know, that's my hot button. So I wanted to start working with better people. And I realized I, I can't really just give my whole business to a GC. So I spent about 431 hours on my first flip. And, and honestly, it got so bad, like working with the partner, working with the GC who didn't do anything. And I had spent so much time on the flip trying to micromanage this GC just because I didn't want Want my first flip going poorly. So I put like every waking hour into this flip is a $38,000 renovation budget. And I was there all the time and ended up taking well over four months to do 431 of my hours. And I know because I was tracking this because the deal me and my partner had is that, you know, I worried that I would do more work than him. And he says, well, let's track the hours. And if you do more work than me, then I'll pay you 25 bucks an hour for every hour you're in the house that I'm not in the house. So I was actually tracking the hours. It was 431 hours. And that's a lot of hours. 
So I, I ended up doing a lot. And what I really figured out is it was kind of better for me to be the GC. It was better for me to take control of my life. Because uh, without that, you know, where are we really at? So one, my number one mistake, and I'm going to give you a couple mistakes that led to me having such a bad experience on my first flip and with GCs is I let the contractors define my flip budget. I mean, this is what most gurus teach us. I've paid $30,000 for coaching and people have told me, you know, get a GC to do it, you know, put the contracts together and, you know, define everything in a scope of work. And what I realize, all that stuff's very time consuming and people just don't care anything about your contract. They effectively got all your money and then they, they can leave whenever they want. They can do whatever they want. And if you are to pay someone who is really high quality and a good person, they generally want so much money that you can't be competitive against your competitors who are being their own GC. So what we're finding in the Baltimore market and many markets out there is that by being our own GC, we're able to get our work done more affordably and predictably, and we're able to kind of run our own construction business and have complete control of it. If somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do, we get rid of them, we pull them in, we pull them out. And that's how we make our keep everything safe and good. Now, also my big mistake number two was working with what I call one star contractors who are slow and never finish on time. Um, this isn't a real picture of my contractor, but I've actually seen this before not that long ago, uh, a contractor legitimately just sleeping in the second floor of the house in the middle of the day. So yeah, that's not the guy we want. We call them one star. Our best contractors are five. A one star is a not cool. And then the last mistake that I was making quite often is paying my contractors up front before they finish the work. Now, the reason this is a major mistake is that the money is our leverage. We use it to leverage contractors. If we have the money, they often will do what they're supposed to do. If we do not have the money and we've given it to them, then they're going to do whatever they want to do. So the only power we gain over a contractor is the ability to pay them when they complete the work and not pay them if they don't complete the work. Right? It's the only thing we have. So we have to fight really hard not to pay money up front. Uh, it feels like um, for many years people told me, oh, you always have to give people a third down or you know half the money or whatever. And, uh, and I fell for that for a long time. And I, that was my belief. And I thought it was how it was. And I eventually realized that that that's a retail way of doing business. And as house flippers, we're more commercial. And if you really look at the commercial industry, uh, in the commercial world, the way it works when somebody does a renovation or does work is they will bill and get paid 30 days net, which is 30 days later, maybe even 60 days later. So they got to come in and do the work, put all the materials up and then wait 30 days to get a check. So that's how it works in the commercial world. And we are way closer to a commercial business than we are a retail business. Now, I don't pay people 30 days later, 60 days later, but I do believe you do the work and I pay you and I'll pay you very quickly. You won't have to wait very long for the money, but I will not pay you up front because in my experience, when I give all my power away, give my leverage away, it is difficult to get them to do stuff. It's almost like they find reasons to, to create arguments. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure we're not paying people. Um, type in the box. I want to know everyone that's on the call. What are one of the top three mistakes you've made? Is it one, two or three? Um, have you have you paid people? Have you hired like slow contractors uh, or any of the any of the three? Which one do you feel like you've done in the past? I can tell you personally, I've done all three, so don't be ashamed if you've done all three uh, or if you're just doing one of them. Yeah, you know, Dell's like one. And so the reality is, even if you're just doing one of these, um, it's going to cost you a lot of money just doing one of them. But if you're doing all three, then you really have to get, get to it like I did. I had to make a big change because all three of them was making my life pretty tough. Slow contractors. Yeah, guys sleeping on the job. Three, all three. Yeah, Steve, I like that. Me too, man. Very slow contractors. Yep. Yeah. Aaron, all three. David, I, I love that. And then Steve said all three. And Gary's like number two. And you have the slow Doug's like the slow contractors. Yeah, the slow contractors are the bane of our existence. We need them getting done quick. And, and we need leverage over them to do that. And then putting a deposit down, contractor never showed up for work. Um, well, Dave, unfortunately, that is part of this business, and I'm sorry that happened to you. I mean, I know it's happened to me many times, and uh, I don't know if there's something I've been more angry about in my life, honestly. So uh, that's part of why the systems I put together are really about protecting us from that. I don't know what it is, why there's so many contractors that don't like to live up to what they promise, because honestly, being a contractor for a house flipper, uh, for all of my people, is a very lucrative business. You know, a lot of my guys make 100, 200K a year. Um, you know, and that's pretty awesome. You know, most of them 
you know, don't even have teeth. <laughs> and so it's totally cool with me, but you know, they're not exactly presentable or going to work in an office. So it's all good. Jose's like all three, man. So I'm glad to see I've got some people paying people up front. Yeah, that sucks. And I'll talk a little bit about how we don't do that. And then you know, change order during the rehab. I Vena, she just created a new one that we didn't have, but that's a big one. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit later because change orders during the rehab is the number one reason you can't keep your budget. And it is an acceptable practice for a lot of people. And I'll tell you that contractors use it as a tactic to make more money. It's how they increase their profits. See, everything we do is about increasing our profits. We want to make sure that our people are making good money, but we got to make good money too. Our business has to do well. And if it doesn't do well, then we don't get the luxury of staying in this business. So yeah, thank you everyone for the feedback. That's awesome stuff. And John's like, uh, is this replay available? Yes, John, it will be. I think I remember you reaching out saying you had to go somewhere, miss some of it. The replay will be available. So just keep your email and I'll be sending it out to everyone so you guys can do it. I mean, I'm pretty sure it'll be. I'll make sure I send it to everyone. Now, one of the things a lot of people have, and some of you guys are already telling me you're dealing with this, but in this country, 60% of people have reported that they've been part of a contractor scam. And, uh, and I pulled this offline. So I'd love reading the little remarks like, you know, crystal meth addict left drugs in my garage you know, won't fix shoddy work. I mean, I've totally had that happen to me, required half the payment up front that never showed up, right? Like you're speaking, like speaking right to like John and Vina and everyone else. Like that's like, this has happened to a lot of people, me included. Cash to checks and never returned to finish the work, ordered over 10,000 in materials and never arrived. Like posed as a licensed contractor and destroyed my home. Yeah, these are all things that I, that a lot of Americans and people have dealt with. Now, as retail people, you know, they're, we were expected to do things in a way that actually puts us at a huge disadvantage. But I'm going to talk to you tonight about how I protect myself, I keep my risk down, how I run my flipping business and make it very predictable. Um, over the years, because I've spent so much energy trying to get better at being a contractor and understanding that, yes, I am a flipper, but on another hand, I'm a contractor. And I used to be a little bit like, I didn't sign up to be a contractor. No, if I'm going to run a business that makes a lot of money and gives me a lot of freedom and changes a lot of people around me's life, I'm going to need to learn a little bit about construction. The day that I understood that is the day my business started growing like wildfire. And I'll show you some of the details. So my journey was I realized I had to take control. And, you know, like you said, I made this big change. I had to take control of my construction process and I couldn't leave that to someone else. So I started traveling around the country locally. Everyone who was really awesome had been in the game for a long time who I felt like was running a really great business. And I found out the common denominator was no successful flipper that I had met throughout the whole country was using GCs. The first thing that happened when they became a very big, awesome business was they stopped like allowing people to control that piece of their business. So the faster they did it, the faster they grew, the faster they made more money. So it was all about some people just had to make that shift in their mind to say like, you know what, I'm okay with learning contracting. It's a big part of my business. There's a lot of risk. My money's out. So yeah, I'm going to learn some of that because a lot of times we think it takes forever to learn the basics of contracting, but it actually doesn't. Most of the students that work with me, we're able to teach them everything they need to know in just a few months, you know, enough to get started, protect ourselves and start getting a great result. And then you're going to learn over time. As you do houses, you're going to get more and more experience, but now you're heading in a really positive direction of being in control. And that's the key. And I, I learned how to do that, not myself. I never admit to be a genius. The only thing I would say that I've done well in my life is I am willing to listen to others. I'm willing to hire coaches. I'm willing to learn uh, because I know I don't know it. And I know I wasn't born with, you know, a super, you know, high ability to learn and be a smart guy. I've just had to learn it from others. And when other people take a lot of time, maybe the genius is actually in just letting them take all the time and then letting them show me. And uh, so I found a lot of successful people. And it was really interesting to see the common denominator was, Every successful house flipper that I spent time with, they all were in very, very much in control of their construction. Uh, so I decided to do the same thing. Now, my big aha was, is that um, I'm not a genius. Most of us are not geniuses. You know, we're, you know, we're not the number two people in the world and, you know, we're not like Einstein's here. However, um, you know, we need to make things super simple because see, when we have a super simple low tech system to estimate repairs, hire rise our contractors and get stuff done quickly, we're going to follow it. You know, we're going to follow it and we're going to actually stick to it. 
So I realized in any time I made things complex that even I couldn't follow my own complex systems. When I make things so simple that I wake up in the morning, even when I don't feel like doing it, I do it. That's a great system. It also happens to be a great system that your contractors can follow, the people you hire. If you get an assistant, all these people can follow. Hey, G, welcome. Uh, G's actually a contractor. So, hey, welcome, man. I'm not. So you hear me talking bad about contractors. I'm not talking about you, G. OK, just other contractors, man. You know, not you, because G's a pretty cool guy. I'm not, he's been a friend. We've known each other for a long time and he flips, too. So he, he knows both sides of it. So I, I was making sure there's no contractors on here scoping out saying, why is Mike talking crap about us? Because I'm not. I'm just giving real life feedback to what I've experienced. And I imagine a lot of people on here have experienced. So I don't want anybody to be too butthurt saying that Mike hates contractors because I actually love all my contractors. They're so awesome. And, uh, and I really do have a great crew around me that allow me to be in this business. And without them, I would be nowhere. So it's very, very, very important for me to acknowledge that. But I've run through some bad apples, you know, along the way. So I started creating this five step process that I'm going to share with you. And since I've created that process, I went from, you know, just being able to barely get by and make a little bit of money to really doing almost 1156 houses and the date that's actually growing over the last 10 years. And uh, I've now scaled my business back and I only do about 50 houses a year. I was doing as much as 150 a year for many years straight. And, uh, you know, we're kind of like really doing a lot. We had a lot of people and a lot of contractors, a lot of project managers, we're really running a full scale construction business, essentially, along with flipping too. And, uh, and it was only able to do that because of the ability for me to understand at a high level, the construction process um, that for many years I didn't want to learn so yeah man he's like I'm getting ripped off by my own kind oh I know CG yeah I'm sorry about that man even CG's not even actually immune to it and he's a contractor so I'm sorry to hear that it, contractors are pretty slick I've they've even taken me after all the houses I've done I'll say that it happens it doesn't happen very often these days because I'm following this process that I'm showing you. So I'm able now to fit 50 houses a year. Some of these are wholesales, but most of them are actually flicks and flip because I like doing fix and flip. And I do that in about 15 to 20 hours a week before when I was doing more houses, I was spending, you know, a crazy amount of time doing it, dealing with problems, putting out fires. And it just was really hard for me to have any quality of life. So I decided to really make this big change and put this process together is not just a way of making more money, but a way to create more freedom for myself. So I could really run a business that's worth owning and worth having. And so cracking the contractor code is what I call the system that I've put together and what I've created. And when I made this one shift, I was able like just in one year, right? well, in one year, I was able to save like nine grand per flip and over like three years of implementing it. And that's when I started about three years ago, I was able to save uh, upwards for 14,260 some dollars. So it is legitimately like it really saves me a lot of money and allows me to make more per flip. Now my flip stuff, and I'm going to show you, these are some of the deals I did in 16. And you can see I've been scaling my business down because uh, when I was running the really big business, I couldn't have any freedom. 2016, I went out on my own from my partner that we, you know, I own that big business with. And I decided to make a super simple low tech system. I did 29 flips. I was averaging about 25K per flip. This is before I created the process. And then in one year after using the process, my profits actually went up nine grand. Now, this is a, you know, it's just definitely substantial. It's something I was really proud of, but I was most proud of it because what I was seeing a lot of my competitors have a problem with is they were telling me in 2016, 17, 18, and now that the market's been getting harder. So the profits have actually been going down every year because the deals have gotten so hard to find, right? Is anyone else lagging seeing this? Hopefully not. I think I have a some pretty good Wi-Fi here. So Jackie, I hope that's not me. I, I did pay a hundred bucks a month for the, the super Wi-Fi from NASA. So I'm hoping it's not mine because uh, that would suck after I pay all that money for it. But so in 2017, I literally went up all the way $9,000 in the following year while everyone else's profit was going down. My profit went up another 2K and then in 19, I'm up to $14,246 above my original profit that I was making in 16, which is pretty cool. Because everything's about doing less and making more, right? The, you know, for years, I was on this mindset of like, I want to scale my business. I want to grow this big empire. And a lot of that was ego. And I realized that, you know, I just thought that was cool. And as I've gotten a little wiser and I've hired some really wise coaches that are 20, 30 years older than me and sharing some really awesome wisdom with me, you know, we've been talking a lot about scaling down to profit up. So legitimately, you can see like in 2019, um, 
averaging a ton of stuff. This is only about eight months in. So I'll probably, you know, get another 10 to 12 houses done this year, but I'm only doing about 30, 35 houses a year, about 10 wholesale deals, 15 some years. And uh, my profits and income are higher than they've ever been, but I'm also doing less deals than I've ever done. So this is an next year in 2020, I'm looking to do the same thing. So every year I'm scaling down, but what's really crazy about this is that my profit keeps scaling up. Now think about that. And that's the type of business I've always wanted to run. I just didn't realize it. And once I put my heart to it and I was like, Mike, I'm going to do less and make more. I started discovering the ways to do that. And that's in my five-step process. I'm going to show you that right now. So some of my students have been using this and getting great results. Ray and Hannah from New Jersey. When Ray and I started working together, he had his whole business. He had done almost 20 flips in a year, but he was dependent on one GC. And that GC started to have some, you know, just getting a little burnt out essentially and just, you know, stop performing. And then Ray's whole business business kind of came to a stop because he essentially was dependent on one person. Ray actually came to work with me and me and him started working on him having a complete system for buying, selling houses and do, being his own GC. And he's taking control back now. Now he's starting to do more flips. He's got complete control. He doesn't have any eggs in one basket. He's got it spread across multiple people. So if one guy doesn't show up, his business will keep running. He will not have one person. And, you know, honestly, you know, he's going to have some of his best years coming back when he was working with the GC at some of his worst years. Uh, me too, by the way, whenever I work with GCs, not been my best year for sure. Also, my other student, Samira, she's doing her first house. So again, Ray came to me and he had already was doing 15, 20 houses a year. Samira's new. She had never done a house. She didn't even have any construction experience. And she started following this. She was an event planner and she purchased her first flip. She's actually managing it daily as we speak. And I think she's about two or three weeks from finishing her first flip. And by the way, this is not this is not a, a little house. This is like a 2,500 square foot house she took on. So it's pretty cool that she's taken on a really big flip as her first flip. And it hasn't been all, all fun and games, but she is learning a ton. She's taking control and she's well on her way to really, you know, understanding the construction process. And when she understands that, then she doesn't have to rely on anyone. And imagine that's how we want to run our business. We want to be the leader of our business. We want to be in control. And once I got in control of mine, I started getting a lot of great results. When people ask me, like, how do you flip something so quick? How are you so consistent? How are you getting these results? It's It was just one thing, honestly. It was my ability to really decide that and be okay with learning to be a contractor myself. Now, I don't have to get out and swing a hammer and do all that. I'm just managing the overall planning strategy, people. You know, I'm making sure my house is and I have complete control, my fingers on the pulse of everything that's going on. And my students are doing the same thing. So some of the three biggest myths that I'll say about contractors are you need to get three estimates to find the best price. That's a crazy myth that I used to believe. And I will tell you getting three estimates is kind of like the fastest way for you to lose your mind. You know, you get out, you get these days, you get three estimates and you know that it's like supposed to cost 5k. You're allowed to get estimates for 10k, 20k, 25, 30. I've seen some of the craziest prices. You could sit there, you could get 25 estimates and you might not find someone willing to work for the price that you want to work for because that's the way it works. Um, so what we do instead is we control our own costs. We standardize it. So we know, and I learned this from Lowe's. I didn't invent this like Lowe's and Home Depot does this when they hire someone to do flooring for them. You know, like you can go pay Lowe's and they'll do flooring for you. Well, they hire subcontractors and they pay them X amount of per square foot to do the flooring. Everything is standardized. So when that contractor comes in, they know what they're going to make. They know what to expect. And now they figured out how to make money in that system. So we're going to follow an exact system, just like Lowe's and Home Depot and all them. And we're going to have pricing that's very similar to subcontractor pricing, because when we're flippers, we can actually act as our own GC. We don't have to have a GC license to do our own stuff. Now you do to do it for other customers, but for us, we can do our own thing, which is kind of cool. Right. And then, so, uh, everyone, so thank you guys for, you know, coming on and everybody's clear. So that's good. It looks like, uh, probably just some lagging. Sometimes these things come behind. Hopefully it'll catch up for you. Now make sure we get a, I'll make sure we get some stuff out to everyone. So there's a replay for anyone who showed up late. Uh, anyone who maybe got some lag that way you can see you're not missing anything. Okay. So second big myth is contractors should manage the project and know exactly how much time the work should take. The number one reason for years that I wasn't able to get my stuff done quickly on time was because I was asking the contractor, how long should this take? And it was like eight weeks. And then next thing you know, it's like 12 weeks or 16 weeks. And yeah, you know, and they would have a lot of reasons. They were like, oh, we ran into this, you know, it snowed and my grandmother's passed away. And uh, well, I found some stuff behind the wall. You've probably heard all this. Oh, my truck broke down. That's a good one. 
I feel like I hear that one quite often. And we would just hear a lot of the same stuff. And it, it would just really drive me crazy because I, you know, I'm counting on this house getting done in eight weeks and now it's taking, you know, 12, 13, 14 weeks. Um, that's additional holding costs for me. More importantly, it's additional opportunity costs because the money I have in that flip represents when it gets out of that flip, an opportunity for me to buy my next flip and make more money. So <clears throat> the faster we can get it out, the better. So when you get someone, when you take control of your timeline, you don't ask contractors and you start creating just like we have standardized pricing we actually have standardized work times and we want to make sure we know like estimated time so if someone's installing cabinets in a kitchen we know that's two guys for one day tops now that helps us understand pricing it helps us understand and be able to predict how long it should take to do each job so um, if something's not getting done on schedule it's generally just a manpower issue we don't have enough people in the house and that's what we've seen so anytime we have an empty house it's bad like we gotta have some people in there doing some work and getting some cool stuff done. And then the last thing is flipping is a high risk uh, activity, which, um, okay, I'm gonna agree with that if you don't know your stuff, but I, the disagreeing with it and why I think it's a myth is that they think it's high risk, but it's only high risk if you don't know what you're doing. And when you start to learn the construction piece and you, you become a master of finding deals and, and really being able to get the right houses and understanding the math and the equations. And once you learn that stuff, I have, I'm a 10th grade dropout. I went back and got my GED and th this stuff isn't that complicated if you're willing to study it until you understand it. Uh, I've never met anyone willing to do the work who could not get house flipping down and make money. Uh, I've, I've met people who are like, you know, I can't make this work, but they weren't putting a lot of time into it because there was other more important things in their life. And if you're going to be a great house flipper, it has to be important to you like anything in this world, right? I mean, there's people that go to school to get a four-year degree and you guys work your butts off and you pay a bunch of money to a college. But when somebody becomes a house flipper, they think they can do it in a weekend seminar, right? But I mean, if you know, you become a nurse, you would at minimum go to school for four years. And then you're going to spend, you know, some years learning your craft. So you might be six years into becoming a good nurse, but when you become a good house flipper where you can make tons of money every year, like people don't want to really put the energy in. So if you guys want to be awesome and you want to do good stuff, know that it's a commitment. Now there's definitely some shortcuts. You can learn systems from people like me, other experienced investors, so you can do it faster, but know there will be some work for anything we do. Okay. And I always say that up front because I want people to understand that if you're going to run a great business, then you are totally going to have to put the work in and learn and, you know, become good at the things you're not good at. What you can't do is hope that someone else out there will do it for you. You need to be in control of your business. So flipping very much not risky. If you can know how to take a, it's a calculated risk if you know your stuff, but it's a very favorable calculated risk. Um, think about the casino. You go to the casino, the house always wins. If you build out your business properly, you don't pay people up front, you understand your standardized pricing, you understand how to put your timeline together, you understand how to handle contractors that don't keep their commitments, and you understand the process I'm getting ready to share with you, you become the house. You're like a casino. Now, does a casino take a risk that they might lose one day? Yes, but in the long run, the casino never loses. They're always going to be a winner. And then once you put your perfect system together, then you start to make house flipping not risky. If you don't have this system, I promise you, you're going to become the opposite side of the casino. And that's the player, the gambler. The gambler comes in, the little old lady, she's putting her quarters in the machine, her whole retirement's going in there. Well, she's definitely going to lose, right? She might have some days where she wins a free turkey or maybe a buffet dinner, but for the long term, she is going to lose. And, you know, maybe she's having fun doing it, but the casino will always win. So when we're house flippers, we need to learn our stuff so we can become the house. I want you to be on the favorable side, right? Doesn't mean you won't have risk. It just means you will, you will take and calculate that risk and you'll understand what it is and you will not allow it to get in your way. So we'll jump. So that's definitely a myth for sure. So let me know what some of the myths are that are holding you back in the chat box. Uh, we'll take two seconds. Let everybody catch up. Hey, Jerry, uh, I'm in. I welcome everyone who's just jumping on. G, I see John and Benna and Jay. Welcome everyone. Charles, Dave, Aaron. Uh, let me know what, what you guys are coming up. Some of the myths that you're struggling with that you're running into quite a bit. And we'll jump right into the content. Like uh, this is a lot of content here. It's a lot of really big stuff. That's a big part of the foundation of what I'm getting ready to teach you. You need three estimates. Yep, Delante, that's a that's a big one. A lot of people are still getting estimates, and you can spend so much time dealing with that. And 
You know, Eric says, I'm not sure, you know, uh, I'm not sure who to trust because I'm a newbie. Yep, yeah, I agree. When you're a newbie, you should you should not trust until you know what's going on. Yeah, and I can't successfully flip a house without a, with a full-time job. Dave, I actually love that one, and thank you for sharing that. But when I got into this business, I had a full-time job, and I was working about 60 hours a week, so it wasn't exactly an easy full-time job. What I realized is when you don't have a lot of time, you actually build better systems because you'll build systems around the time you have available. So a lot of times people think that if I have eight hours a day, I'd be a much better flipper. But what I've seen in my experience is if you have two hours a day to work, you will find a way to squeeze that work into the two hours. It's called compression of time, right? We, we make things bigger and harder than they need to be when we have eight hours. But if we only got two, we make them more streamlined. So a big part of me growing my business, when people here only work 15 to 20 hours a week, the secret is, uh, and they're always like, how'd you get to doing that? I just decided I was only going to work 15 hours a week, and I took everything that was taking me 40, 50 hours a week, and I decided I was going to do it in 15. And, uh, and that's pretty cool stuff. And that's uh, and it's a very true thing. And when you have a full-time job, you will have to apply that type of system. You will definitely want to take the most direct route. And then Amin said, um, uh, estimating myself. So yeah, for sure. And then I'm going to share with you uh, a gift at the end that's going to show you a lot about pricing and how to do that. Obviously, you need to practice to use it, but there'll be some cool stuff in there. So thank you guys for all the myths and you know what's holding you back. This is powerful stuff. It's all the same stuff that was holding me back when I was new. So I'm going to jump into some of the content. And the reason we can do this. So what I want to work with you today is this is my five star contractor funnel that I, and I'm going to show you the five steps, which is standardize the pricing so that you can do your estimates or men, he can, you know, you go in and do all the estimates yourself and then the estimated work time. So you know how long every project should take, right? Letting contractors manage your project. Like Steve said, like you can start doing that because you understand your time. And then the fast work sequence is the key to how you're able to do it efficiently so you can make more profits. And then the fourth part is you're going to hire a contractor. You need to know when they're bad seeds, when you're going to need to know, like, right. And when Jackie said that the competition's too tough, yeah, the competition is tough, but I have to promise you a lot of your competition is not on webinars, learning what I'm going to teach you tonight. They're not investing in their education, investing in their, their systems. Like most people just figure this out at a low level, make a living and they just keep doing it. And uh, there's so few people out there who are taking it to the next level and being and willing to invest in like being good at this. So uh, the fastest way, Jackie, to figure this out and, you know, to make your competition nowhere near as tough as you think, step your game up and then watch because they're probably not stepping theirs up. Right now, they might be a little ahead of you and you just got to leapfrog in front of them. And that just takes some studying and some practicing. And the last piece we're going to talk about is the critical contract clauses and all the ways we protect ourselves against contractors because I'm really big. I hate losing money. I don't like getting ripped off. So I'm really big in finding ways to never be ripped off. With that being said, I get ripped off sometimes. Uh, I will tell you, I've only been ripped off for probably about five to seven thousand bucks in the last three years, which I think is kind of outrageous when I've done about 120, 30 flips in the last three or four years. And uh, so I've got a really good record. I'm not being ripped off by much. Over the years, I've been ripped off like crazy. And, uh, and sometimes we have to learn <clears throat> through the school of hard knocks. So when you wonder how I created this stuff, it, well, it was completely out of necessity because I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't stand people constantly, constantly. Well, when you do all five of these things, you're going to bring in contractors and at the bottom, you're going to funnel out. And it's going to lead to that five star contractor who is fast, efficient, wants to follow your system, understands your pricing, understands the quality of work you want to do and are okay being held accountable to the commitments they make. You're going to find that five-star contractor, that good person. But you see all the contractors that go in to weed down to that one. So we're going to talk about how we do that through the process. And so we're ready, everybody ready to see behind the curtains? Give me a big yes. I'm ready. Let's do this. Yes. Yay, yay. I don't care. Whatever you want to put in there. Uh, let's know if you're ready to jump in because we are going to jump in. I'm going to take a drink of water and I'm going to get through the content for you guys. Uh, so you have some cool stuff. And it's a, it's a really awesome topic here that a lot of the students love when they read it. Everyone's coming in. Thank you, David, Steve, and the men, and uh, Cheryl, and Doug, and Matthew, Eric. Let's do it. Let's go. Absolutely. 
Gary's like, duh, <laughs> I got it, man. Thanks, man. Let's go. All right, let's jump in. Everyone's ready. So let's start with step one, which is estimating repairs with standardized pricing. And one of the questions I've been and a few people asked earlier was like, how do you, you know, do your own estimates? Now, the key to this is, is in your business, you're going to have to understand what the competitive pay for the market is. And when I say competitive pay for the market, I don't want you to figure out what the pay is for retail. I want you to figure out what the pay is for like flippers. And that's going to be what we call wholesale pay. So this is generally like a subcontractor, not like a GC. Uh, when we use subcontractors, they're going to understand standardized pricing better because that's how they're used to working. They're used to saying, okay, I will do a window and I'll install it, put the capping on and everything, and I will charge you $100 per window. So you got 10 windows, that's a thousand bucks. And when you understand that pricing and they understand it, then you can create a relationship that allows you to be able to you know, work with them long term. Now, <clears throat> The key to this is you got to understand what a lot of your competitors are paying. So if your competitors are paying 60 K to renovate a house on one, two, three main street, well, you at least need to be able to do yours for 60 K. If that's the average of what people are paying, what you don't want to do is pay 70 because you're hiring a GC, because then that would mean you'd have to offer 10 K less for your house. And if you think it's hard to get deals, I promise you, if you're offering 10 K less than most of your competitors, it's pretty much impossible to get deals. Now, if you're on the other side of it, where you're, you're coming in at 50 and you're underpaying, then you're going to struggle finding any contractors to do the work. So you have to find that perfect balance between paying someone enough money, but not overpaying them where you lose your competitive edge. So you understand what that is. And once you know that pricing, you can standardize it. You understand. And that sheet that I'm going to give you at the end is going to share with you a lot of my standardized pricing that I've been using over the years. You know, so you can start to standardize a lot of the stuff in your rehab. Now we do it through a line item budgeting. So. <clears throat> There's so many weird tools out there where you just, you know, answer seven questions and it'll tell you what a house is going to cost to renovate. You know, those don't work very well if anyone's ever used them. And I know because I, I love every tool. I buy every tool and I test it. And if it worked, I'd be using it in my business. I'd be sharing it with you today. But line item budgeting does work where we walk through and we look and we say, okay, uh, plumbing is going to cost X. You know, cabinets are going to cost X. Tile for the bathrooms is going to cost X. Painting is going to be this. The roof's going to cost this the windows and we line item everything out. There's about 40 to 50 line items in every house. Now it seems a little overwhelming, but it's not. Once you understand the standardized price of it, it's just like filling out a sheet, answering questions, and you start to learn this very quickly. And when I say very quickly, most students that are doing this and working with me, we're going back and forth, we're kind of having a lot of communication, 30 to 60 days, they understand it really well. If they knew nothing starting, if they're already kind of done some flips, then they can pick this up in a week or two and they start getting a feel for it. And most of the time when they were already doing flips like Ray and them who had already done 40 or 50 flips, it was all about just figuring out where Ray and them were paying and Hannah were paying too much. So so that we could get them back on track with some of the stuff. And we found some things they were paying too much for, and we found some things they were right on target with, but it was them having a deep understanding of what they should be paying and what they shouldn't be paying. And uh, so you want to learn the per unit price. So <clears throat> everything can be broke down into units. And this is, you know, standard project management is we want to understand like how much does it cost to do a window? How much does it cost to do a square foot of tile? How much does it cost to do a square yard of carpet? And when we start understanding these per unit pricing, we can start just applying it. You know, if we somebody's like, OK, I need, uh, you know, 400 square foot of hardwood, we can go measure. And how you measure hardwood, I'll give you a quick example is if it's 10 by 10 room, you go 10 times 10, that's 100 square feet. You add 10 percent for waste, which would be 110. And now if you know it costs two dollars a square foot to install the hardwood. Well, guess what? It's pretty simple math. Uh, well, uh, not so simple. I think that's 220 bucks. All right. Let me know if I'm wrong. I'm sorry if I am, but I don't have a calculator in front of me, but I believe that's $220 for labor. And then, you know, the material is going to cost about two bucks for the, the wood you're going to buy and about 50 cents for the pad that goes under it. And if there's any tram or shoe mold and you need to be putting up, that's standardized too. And you can just walk through it and within minutes, you know, okay, my flooring is going to cost me X dollars. It's really cool when you're able to do that. So that's the first step to this. Everyone needs to learn that. If you're not currently doing that and you're letting contractors figure this out for you and you're not really doing this at a high level, this is the reason you're struggling to get a lot of stuff. So, um, and thinking you need to get three estimates, you don't. You need to be making the estimates yourself, like Lowe's and Home Depot. Follow them. They're beasts. You know, Lowe's and Home Depot, they, they crushed every little hardware store out there. So, you, you know, they're, they're big business and they understand stuff they do smart. You know, that's how they do 
it. And I just copied off of them because I'm there so much buying stuff and uh, kind of, you know, I'm always there picking materials out and doing cool stuff. So, you know, I've paid attention to how they do business and it's really smart actually. And this is how we created all the standardized pricing, the per unit pricing, line item budgeting. And I can walk in a house now in 15 minutes and I can walk through and answer every line item. And it takes me 15 minutes and I've got a super solid budget that also can double as the scope of work. So I don't do long winded scope of works where, you know, I write 19 pages because my contractors, honestly, like they don't like it. They're just like, dude, it's too complex. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, and I'm like, here, I just want you to do this one line item because you're the carpet guy. See, this is your line item. This is what you do. So I do all that work and I prep all that for them. It takes me 15 minutes. I might spend another 15 to 30 minutes writing some notes of like, okay, carpet's going to be X amount of square foot. It's going to go on the steps and upstairs and I'm going to throw it in the basement and it's this much and it's the color we're using. This is the pad we want. Here's where we're buying it from. Yeah, you know, I can do all that in about a half hour. And, uh, and when you're new, you'll take a little bit longer, but you know, the fact that you're able to do it, like that's amazing. That is you gaining all your power back and taking away contractor's ability to rip you off. Like you even heard it. G's a contractor. He's been one for years and he's like, they ripped me off. <laughs> I was like, I'm fine. I'm sorry, G. I'm not making fun of you, but it is kind of ironic. And I'm actually a contractor too. I'm considered to be a licensed contractor now for 20 years and they ripped me off. So not much though, because I use these. I'm very, I follow my own systems. When I have been ripped off, which is kind of hilarious. Um, I just look back at it. I'm like, well, how did they get me? And I realized that even though I have some amazing systems, I don't know if you guys have ever done this before, but I don't always follow my own stuff. Like, you know, I, I know I shouldn't be eating a cookie, but sometimes, you know, I should be eating a salad. Sometimes I eat a cookie. You know, we don't always follow what we're supposed to do. And when that happens, we usually end up losing some money from contractors, unfortunately. So step number two, and this is going to how I finish my stuff fast. So first, we got to figure out estimated work completion times. Okay, we need to know that it takes X to do Y. And, you know, like we essentially know that we can install cabinets in a day. We know that like doing hardwood floor of 500 square foot might be two days. Doing a roof that's 15 square if you're just tearing it off and putting a battle on, it's like two days, maybe a day even. Um, so we start to understand all that. If they're doing a whole house of sheetrock, for me, it's about a week, roughly, with drying time and insulation and all the different coats. So once we understand how much it long it takes to do things, it helps us understand now how we can break the pricing down. So see, if you get a carpenter and that carpenter is going to spend, let's say, one day uh, with a second person who is maybe a helper, well, we know that carpenter is going to want to make about $250 a day. His helper is going to want to make about $150. So you got about $400 a day. So if you came to them and say, hey, I'll give you $500 to put the cabinets in, there's a pretty good chance they'd be okay doing that. They would be able to make a little bit of money. They get in, nice, easy day of putting cabinets in. They'll knock it out for you and make money. So we asked how many people for how many days. So this is why, right? My guys do 200 sheets in four days. Dude, that's awesome. Like that's the kind of speed you want. So seven days, you know, I've seen my guys do actually 300 sheets in one day and put a coat on it and then like come back two days later, put another coat. So about seven days because dry time and everything. But, you know, that's fast too. Four days is all good. You know, we, we just don't want them taking two weeks, right, G? That's the key. Because you know, if they're taking two weeks, then you're going to be slow and your completion time is going to be really not competitive, right? We don't, and, and I've seen many sheetrock guys take two three weeks i've seen them do 10 15 sheets and do maybe like three weeks into it and you like they look like they're dying over there and you're like you feel sorry for them and you're almost like hey you're gonna just ask you to leave and just give you a little money because it looks like you're dying in here i don't want you like passing out on my job because uh, not everyone is a craftsman not everyone understands what to do so when you understand how many people for how many days and you understand how long work takes and how many man hours it takes to do work, you start to have the ability to be able to connect the dots and understand pricing, understand completion times, schedules and timelines, right? So most contractors, most flippers don't even get this because they've spent so much time letting other people tell them what should be, right? Where you can start learning this for yourself. So you start then, you create a schedule once you have that. Now, once you have a schedule, now the next thing is you got to make sure that's a, let's say you're going to do a 50k renovation you're going to do it six weeks that's your schedule now you got to hold your contractors uh, accountable to that schedule okay and how we do that is uh once we're very clear about how long things should take if we start to see anything that comes outside of that uh you know that predictable timeline then we have, we, it starts to kind of pop out like a red flag. So if we know the sheetrock should take four days or seven days, 
right? Then we also want to make sure that um, it gets two weeks or it starts to be 10 days when we start having discussions then. And we have a process for how once we get past a certain timeline, we can write into our contracts, performance clauses, anything. If someone starts to get way out of timeline, I'm having lots of discussions with them until they either step up and do what they're supposed to do uh, or they just quit because they're tired of me nagging them, right? It's like, my wife does that. I'm not letting you do that to me. And I will nag them every day in the nicest possible way because I don't want to make them angry. But at the same time, I can't run my business if they're not getting done. So I've got to hold them accountable. Sometimes when I was new, I kind of felt bad about it because one of the one of the manipulation tactics that have been used on me is, well, they would get angry with me for no reason. They're like, well, you bother me. I'm a professional and, you know, and all that stuff. And now I'm like, hey, man, I get it totally. But, you know, we said four days and now we're five days in. We need to get finished. And um, if you can't get finished, and let's talk about who we can bring in. So we start having those discussions because, you know, obviously not everyone is going to be really passionate and have a sense of urgency. We need to help them have a sense of urgency. So step three is our profit boosting framework that I use. And, and this fa framework is something that I've honed over the years through all the flips I've done. We really have a high profit work sequence. And one of the ways I was able to accomplish one of the biggest things I've ever been able to accomplish, which uh, recently, about six months ago, I was able to do a 45K renovation and do it in literally just seven days. And I did it by using this high profit work sequence. And what we were doing in that sequence was we were taking and you know, a lot of the beliefs was like the plumber and electrician can't work together and the HVAC guy. And I realized we can actually stack contractors and find a way for them to work together. So we have more people in the house because I realized a 45 K renovation with like four people in the house on average takes around six to eight weeks. But if I can get eight people in, I could cut it in half. And then my brain went even crazier and I'm like, well, if I can get then 16 people in the house, I can cut that even in half. And then, so I ended up getting 20 to 21 people in the house for seven days. And I was able to do 45K renovation in seven days. So we have a video, it's out there in the world somewhere. If you just look up seven day flip Mike Green, we actually videoed the whole thing because we thought it was gonna be an epic failure. We thought it was gonna be some fun. And we figured if we did it in 10 days, so what, it'll be a lot of fun and cool. Uh, but what we realized is it's a manpower, a man, man hour equation. So less man hours, and that could be women or men, but we call it man hours because that's the industry term. Um, don't know why, but you know, someone had met at that probably a man. But uh, if you know a certain amount of man hours, then your gonna, house is going to get done pretty quickly. And then if you double those man hours, you get more work in there every day, then the house gets done faster. And if you go to your house and there's no one in there, that means there's no man hours. And that means nothing's getting done. And then, then you know why your house is taking so long. Because see, a lot of contractors like to jump from job to job because they've been paid and they're always chasing that deposit. So that's why we never pay them up front and we keep all of our relationships very, you do the work, I pay you. So that way, if they're not doing anything, they don't start. Then, you know, it is what it is. Hey, what's up, G. Daniel? Thanks for jumping in, man. And uh, we got some good stuff. I think you came just in time for the good stuff. So we're welcome. And then the fourth part is going to be hiring the Rockstar contractors that charge the best price. So one of the biggest common myths that I've had for a long time or beliefs that I wasn't correct is that when you pay people less money, you actually are going to like get worse people. And I'm not saying that's not true sometimes, but I can tell you that my best people right now are also affordable. And here's why. And it's something that really took me a while to understand because it's a very counterintuitive belief. And I didn't understand that some of the best people are affordable because they're very effective and efficient. When somebody can walk in a job and they can like, like G's guy, he's like, man, they did 200 sheets in four days. I'm assuming they're pretty affordable because they can knock out 200 sheets in four days. They don't have to charge a million dollars. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it, Alfred, man. Thank you for popping that up for everyone, man. Thanks a lot. Because I, I don't even know where it is. It's out there, but I appreciate it, buddy. And, and everybody's welcome to download that link if you guys want to check it out. It's pretty cool stuff. And we had a lot of fun doing it. So the belief is, is that if you hire someone who's cheaper, in my experience, there's two types of people who are cheaper. There's people who are um, not competent, so they're cheaper for that reason. <laughs> So they're cheaper. So like G's person who can get four, you know, 200 sheets done in four days, then like totally he's going to be able to, that person should be very affordable. And G's not going to overpay anyone because he knows the pricing and he understands what he should pay. So, um, but because they can get done so fast, they're affordable. So it took me a while to wrap my head around that because all I had seen is the people who were cheaper, but they sucked, right? So we, we totally, there, those people exist and we have to learn how to weed through them. Now, how do I find my contractors? They're like, Mike, where do you find your contractors? Is there a secret place where all the good contractors are? 
No, there's not. I actually go straight to so 20 bucks a sheet. That's pretty fair. We pay 15 to 20. And yeah, man, if they're, they're getting done quick like that, that's awesome. So um, basically where we go is Facebook groups, Craigslist, supply houses, and other investors. Um, now, you probably have heard this is a good place to get people before, but it's not about where you go. Right. It's about how what you do with them when you get them there. We're going to talk a little bit about that because, yes, Craigslist is actually an awesome place. But I will tell you this, that on Craigslist, you're going to get a lot of people that aren't good. And, but there's plenty of people that are good on Craigslist. And our job is instead of saying Craigslist sucks, because I said that for a while, and I was like, it sucks. Everybody on there is crazy. And I've heard people get murdered and stuff. And, and it, it's not untrue, but the reality is, is that what you need is a system. And I've created a system, an actual funnel, I call it. And I bring contractors through. I make them do applications. I pre-qualify them on the phone. And I just weed these suckers out. And I get rid of them as fast as I humanly can, because most of them are not going to be that great. And I think G just nailed it by saying trial and error, but I don't, I don't spend, I don't try, I'd like, I don't like the error that much. So I spend a lot of time on the phone weeding out the people who just aren't going to be good. And how I do that is I pre-qualify price because the first thing I need to know, are, are we on the same page when it comes to pricing? Because I happen to know that the best people will understand my pricing and they have worked with that kind of pricing before. Because if they work for other flippers like G and other people in here who are flipping, then they're going to have a standardized price because you don't really work for a flipper for a long time if your pricing is too high. You know, because you, flippers can't make any money if they're paying you way too much. Right. So it is really important that you're actually getting stuff done cheap. So we pre-qualify the price on the phone. See, you can actually talk to about 10 contractors on the phone, maybe even up to 20 people on the phone for the same time it takes you to meet someone in person. So one of the big mistakes I made is when somebody like, yeah, man, let me look at your house. Let me see it and I'll give you a price. Fortunately, that didn't work very well because I would be out all day long talking to like five or six, 10 people. When now in like a 30 minute period, I can talk to 10 or 15 people and say, Hey, you know, um, you know, Gary, I'm just going to use your name. Um, you know, this is what we pay. We pay 20 bucks per sheet for sheetrock. Does that work for you? That's hanging and finish. And, uh, you know, G Gary should know if he's a sheetrock guy, he's either going to be like, yeah, that works. Uh, or it doesn't. Now, obviously, I might ask them how much they charge first in case they charge 17 or 18. But if they're like, I charge 24, I could be like, standard, we charge 20, we only pay 20. Now, I know you normally want 24. Are you able to make me profitable at 20? If so, I can give you a lot of repeat business because it is a pretty big deal. If they can understand how to do it for 20, then they're going to get a lot of work, right? G's going to use them. Most people, Delante, Dave, Alfred, you guys are going to use them because that pricing is really good. So we start with the pre-qualifying the price on the phone so we can weed out all those people that are going to drive us nuts and kind of get all that done on the phone. And then we do an on-site interview. Now, the on-site interview, for the most part, is just getting them there and seeing if their story stays the same. So if they're like, yes, I'll do it for 20 bucks a sheet, and then they get there and they're like, nah, it's 30 bucks a sheet. Got it. Sorry for wasting your time, but this is not going to work. We are 20 bucks a sheet because see, we standardize things. We don't let the contractors tell us what we can pay. When we bought the house, we bought it based on paying 20 bucks a sheet for sheetrock. We did not do it based on $30 a sheet for sheetrock. So we can, fortunately, if we want to make profit, we got to stick to our guns when it comes to the pricing. So as we get the on-site interview, you know, we're looking to see first, are they on time? I know that's a simple thing, but you know, the first promise they made to you is that, Hey, I'll be at your house at 11 o'clock and give you an estimate or check it out and, you know, make sure we're all good. Well, if they come at 1130, they basically already broke a promise to you. Now I'm, will tell you that over the years, I haven't had great experiences with people who show up. I've had times when people showed up a little late, but called and said, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I'm really late, this happened. They're very communicative about it. And, uh, and I'll give them a second chance if that happens. But if they just show up randomly 30 minutes late, I generally have another contractor coming 30 minutes later and I just let them know like, hey, someone else is here. Uh, you're like 30 minutes late, man. I apologize. But um, this right now, you can take a look around if you'd like, but like ultimately it's probably not going to work out because you're like 30 minutes late and you didn't call or anything. So, um, and I just don't hire them and I'm okay with that because I'm very abundant because I have a nice funnel of people coming in through all these different sources. See, a lot of times people are like, Hey, how do you get deals? Well, you spend money on marketing and get this funnel of motivated sellers, but nobody spends one penny on contractors. And if you're doing flips, 50% of the equation, maybe even more is your contractor. So I want to make sure I have people coming to me at all times. So that way I can weed and I always have a, like a really good stable of great people. And then the next thing is, and most people don't understand this the interview doesn't really end until you hire them for a job and then they actually in real life go do everything and show you they, they can keep every promise they made to you 
Because see, here's the reality. They're going to make a lot of promises and people talk a great game. Like one of my students, Samir, had one of the coolest guys come out. He sounded great, said all the right stuff. And then he did the cabinets and we were looking at him today and I was like, oh, they don't look too good. You know, she's like, oh, he sounded so great. And I was like, yeah, I met him too. He sounded like he really knew what he was doing. The reality is um, either him or who he hired did not know what they were doing. And uh, it turned out pretty poorly. So, you know, she's working through that now. And uh, that's part of what you have to learn as a, you know, as a flipper, how to work through things that don't go as well as you'd like. But the real time work interview is the last real interview. And that interview doesn't even end at the first job. Often I'm truly watching and paying attention to people over like a bunch of the jobs. So I like to see that somebody does like at least like, you know, two or three jobs for me consistently before I start to give faith in them and believe in them and give loyalty to them. Because if they can't make it through a couple jobs with the standardized pricing, then in general, it's probably not going to be a good long term fit. Right. So do you have a per price square foot base on total square foot for a house or for, for, for rehab? I do not not do that because that's highly inaccurate. So um, I, you know, a lot of gurus teach that um, that's just going to be all over the place and it's not an accurate way of doing it. Um, so if you do per foot or per, you know, square foot for a full rehab, um, you know, you're going to be way off or way low, way high. I recommend breaking it down item by item so that you can get a more detailed uh, budget and you can make sure you actually can honor that budget. When you do per square foot, you can nail it sometimes and you could be really wrong sometimes. And uh, we don't really have a lot of room to be 10K off. This market is very competitive. So if you want to win and really, you know, run your business at a high level, you'll want to dive in and kind of learn and take it to that next level. Now, a lot of like gurus are teaching this per square foot thing as a new, for real newbies, just saying, hey, you know, just do this and it's, you know, if you're a wholesaler, I would say that's not a bad tactic because you don't have to really be right. But if you're a rehabber, you definitely are going to have to take it to that next level. And that's what we're talking about here. So you can get into that. And then the last piece is how do you protect yourself against shady contractors? Now, a lot of people think there's like, you know, ninja contracts and clauses and all that, but there is. But I have to tell you, if you write a contract with a contractor who's dishonest, right? Well, that contractor totally could just be like, whatever. And just walk away and not honor one word on that contract. Uh, I mean, he really could not do anything. So, uh, you know, contracts are great. I use contracts more as a way to have a, you know, a clear understanding of what we're going to do. But I have no intentions to take a contractor to court because it's really hard to take them to court. And if they're broke and they're shady, um, well, the reality is you're probably not going to get anything from them anyhow. So how do I protect against shady contractors? Well, the number one thing is it's not the contracts. It's doing one small job at a time. So I never hire GC and let them do a $50,000 renovation for me. I look at the first line item of all my line items, my 40 or 50 line items, and I'm like, okay, that's going to be demo. Uh, you know, so let's do that. I got 1100 bucks in the demo. Uh, right, let's start with that, see how things go, and then we'll go from there. And like, oh, we need the whole job. We don't do small jobs like this. I'm like, well, you'll be done in a day. I'll pay you, and you get the next couple line items if you do a great job. And if you do those couple line items, I'll give you the next five. And then if you do that, then I'll give you the whole house eventually. But you have to earn your trust. I don't just trust people because they tell me they're great. I trust people once they've earned their trust. And so, again, I mean, you're getting paid the same amount. So this is one of the biggest tactics that I've put together that has really been helping me kind of save myself from, like, tremendous amounts of headaches. Until someone has built loyalty with me and they've really built trust with me and showed me, not, not told me, because there, a lot of people are good at talking. Very few people are good at delivering. So when they've really showed me that they're good at what they do and they, they're caring, they're thoughtful, they're easy to work with, then that's when I start to give them more jobs. But I always start with one small job. And I want you to run this equation in your head. If you hire someone to do demo for 1100 bucks, in theory, your, your risk, if you don't pay them up front, is really just a few hundred dollars max. I mean, I've had times when, when legitimately I've had to, um, you know, fire someone because they just weren't capable. And I'm like, here's 200 bucks. You know, you kind of just came in and messed it all up, but like, here's 200 bucks, like just not to be a jerk. Right, here you go. And so my loss was 200 bucks on that. And I'm okay with that. I make a lot of money as a flipper. I don't have to, I don't want anybody coming back and firebombing my house and doing anything crazy. So I, I try to take the high road. Now, if they want the whole thousand, they didn't do anything, they get paid nothing because you didn't do anything and they don't deserve to be paid anything. But with that being said, my risk is just a few hundred bucks because now if I, and you take another scenario that a lot of people are using where you hire a GC for 50K and you give them a third down, you give 15K down and they get in, you realize like the work ain't going as well. And they're like, well, it's because we need more money. And the next thing you know, you give them another 10K, you're 25K. You legitimately could lose the whole 25K. 
I mean, you'll they'll have some work in place for it so you won't lose everything, but your risk now instead of being a couple hundred bucks is like ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So you can understand why the one small job at a time is really important. And then the second thing is the payment schedule. This is kind of how you you protect yourself. Shady contractors, I had this conversation today with uh, Samir, one of my students, and shady contractors always want to be paid up front. You know why? Because they have such such a long, long record of people not paying them. They're like, well, if I don't get paid up front, I'm probably not going to get paid because they have a long track record of people not liking their work. Now, good, honest people, like, you know, when I was doing some flooring back in the day, if you said, hey, man, I'll give you a thousand dollars to do a job, I'd just go do a job. Like, hey, man, you got a thousand bucks and people would pay me because they were always happy. And I would go above and beyond to make sure the job was done right and look nice and clean up after myself. And I'd always get paid. I got ripped off one time in seven years. And it was just a, just generally a shady person. It wasn't because he was unhappy. He just was kind of a con artist. But one time was no big deal. I'd done thousands of jobs, so not a big deal. Um, and so good people aren't going to be too pumped about, you know, getting paid ahead of time for work. They're, they're okay. But the, the shady people are always wanting to get paid ahead of time because they know they're not likely to get paid if they don't get paid ahead of time. So one of your best ways to weed out shady people is to have a payment schedule that is very favorable to you and also very favorable to them being accountable to the promises they make. See, if you've got their money, you have the leverage, and that's what we want. We always want to keep the leverage because, see, if we don't keep the leverage and we give it to them, then we're going to get leveraged. And I don't want to be leveraged by a contractor. They have better things. So we also do contracts, but <clears throat> when we do contracts, no, they're only as good as they can be honored. So it's very hard to enforce a contract, but sometimes the contractor believes that they have a contract. In their head, they might think they get sued. I would say the threat of a contract is much stronger than the actual contract. With that being said, in contracts, some of the things we really want in there is the clarity of when they're going to start, when they're going to finish, and what the consequence is if they don't. And we call this a performance clause. It's very important to have that in. I've never enforced a performance clause, but just the 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 you know the looming you know fear of me taking two hundred bucks a day if they don't finish actually got them to finish most of the time or have a discussion with me about how to make some adjustments and then we worked it out it forced them to be communicative with me and us to have a conversation together and then keeping contractors accountable is really a big way that you're going to do it because like honestly if you let people get out of hand a shady contractors are always going to have excuses a friend of mine told me a long time ago you either have reasons or you have results. And it was interesting saying because I thought that was pretty cool because I realized that a lot of my contractors have reasons and that's why they don't have results. They always got excuses. So we can't really accept those, unfortunately. I mean, I know that sometimes if somebody tells me four days, it's going to take five and I don't get too pumped up. But as soon as four days turns into seven, like we're going to have a tough conversation and it turns into eight or nine, I'm going to have to let them go. Right. And, I, and maybe even sooner if um, I feel like they're not, you know, they're not giving me some good stuff, like some stories I haven't heard before. And you know, sometimes they come up with some good stuff and I'm like, all right, man, you get a couple more days. But ultimately, the biggest way to protect against shady contractors is, you know, just hold them accountable. If they say they're going to do something in five days, make them get it done in five days. And if they start taking seven, that's not the end of the world. But if, you know, it starts being two and three weeks then you got to take action. You got to fire them. You need to be in a position where you can fire them. See, when you're with the GC and they start doing that and you, they got 15 K of your money, then you're too fearful to fire them because they got all your money. And if you fire them, you might lose your 15 K. See, now when I haven't paid a contractor and they're seven days into a five day contract and I haven't given them anything, well, it's not hard for me to fire them because I have all the power. I have all the leverage. I could easily bring someone else in and pay that person their money to finish and then give them, you know, pay them for whatever work they've done and then just got ties. So I always have the power to get rid of them, swap them out, bring in someone who's ready to do the job. And, uh, and I let them know that up front, like, hey, if you're, you're, you know, you definitely can do this in five days. Right? Yeah, no problem. And it's like seven days in. I'm telling them, like, after like a couple days late, you might need a little wiggle room. But after a while, I'm going to bring someone else in. Are you OK with that? No, my investors, that's how they work. They don't allow people to take like twice as long because we have a timeline. It's very important we meet that timeline. So these are the five things. And when you follow these five things, I know there's a lot of stuff. Some of it sounded basic. Some of it you might not have heard before, but this is the secret. And when there's huge consequences to not following a process like this, you end up getting ripped off a lot. You end up just having bad results. Um, just really stressed out, to be honest. I can see a lot of my students when they're new and, you know, they're still kind of doing it the old way and they're just starting to switch over to the new way of doing it, they're very stressed out. And then as they get into following the rules and following the 
system, they start to get less stressed out every single day. And they start to go from being very worried and very fearful and just very concerned about their overall like life and stuff. And eventually they start getting stronger and more powerful and they start to take control of their life. So, yeah. And then I think Gerhard said, you remember the roofer that wanted to kill me after the open house? Um, I didn't know he wanted to kill you, but I did. I heard some stuff. But I don't care too much, you know, I'm like whatever. Uh, but I do, I do remember you guys arguing with a roofer. Yes. Um, that happens sometimes. And, you know, and I don't know. I don't know what the outcome was, but you guys probably didn't get along on it. That happens. So there's consequences when you don't follow the process. And those consequences are devastating if you want to run a business. Uh, when you start, there's some really great rewards. However, when you do follow it. So some of the things I've seen when you're not following is you repel rock star contractors. So we talked, talked a lot about finding A players for your business. Um, a lot of people come to me and they're like, Mike, I can't get any A players. I can get people who are reliable and consistent. And, you know, I quickly explained that I couldn't either for years until I had a high level system for them to follow. When I started acting like the big boys, like Home Depot and Lowe's, and I started coming from this position of abundance and saying, here's how I do business. The a players love that. The best people love that. They want to walk into something that's well organized, well thought out, that they, it's predictable, that they can understand. So rock star contractors, the great ones, they love when you have a system and a process because what they hate about people that are say newer flippers or sometimes even veteran flippers, they hate when you're always changing your mind, you're wasting your time, you're not sure about what you're doing, you don't understand the process, that annoys them. And they'll come to work for someone like me or one of my students who has a strong process because for them that feels very predictable. And that's what a lot of people want. They want to be in business for themselves, but they want it to feel that like it has the security of a job, right? They want it to feel like that. So also a big consequence is when you don't have a process, you're not going to finish your flips on time. You're always going to take way longer than you expect it. It's going to be pretty common that that happens all the time. Rarely ever going to be on budget. It's going to start really killing your profits and your dreams. You're going to see the stuff you thought you were going to make 30 or 40K on. You're making 10 or 15K, which is nothing to shake a hat at. I'm happy with 10 or 15K. But I don't want that to be my standard because there is a lot of time, risk, and energy put into a flip. So you want to make sure. Essentially, you're just flushing your business down the toilet. It's going to make you feel like you know your competitors. It's too competitive. The market's too tough. All these things happen as consequences to you not really having this process down. So you really have to take this like note to note. So it's very easy to you know estimate repairs, hire the right contractors, and finish your flips quickly and on time uh, in like the next 30 days. So most people can do this in like 30 days. The question you have to ask yourself is why well, follow this five step process. I'm going to give you some cool tools to use so you can start implementing this in your business. And, uh, and if you are, then just work on it for 30 days, get good at the estimating the time, you know, read the sheet and the free gift I'm going to give you at the end, all that stuff. It's pretty cool. And yes, it's professional like their business and they work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Byron. And so you've got to have a proven system like my five star contractor funnel. Um, I gave it a cool jazzy name, but this is something I've just been doing for quite a while and been, you know, honing it in until it got better so that I can make more money. Because when I, I have a good system, I know I make more money. You can see my profits went from 25K a house to, to 40K a house in just three years using a really repeatable system. I used to just go with my gut because I was like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'll just make it work. And, you know, I was doing a pretty good job. I flipped some houses, made a living, but it wasn't things didn't get great until I started implementing a process. And for a long time, because I did know a little, it was actually bad for me because, you know, when we think we know a little, we actually think we're, we're not very humble, right? We need to be humble about our learning and really understanding how to do some cool stuff. So I'm not sure why you guys showed up today, what your big thing you wanted to get from this was, whether you're working on your first deal or maybe you're already flipping a bunch of houses and you're tired of dealing with unreliable contractors or maybe just fed up with constantly going over budget and over timeline. I know I certainly was for years. One of the things that drove me crazy and maybe you're tired of losing money on your flips or, you know, the money you should be making. Sometimes it's profit. Sometimes you're actually writing a check that all sucks either way. Uh, or maybe it's just something that, you know, new and you want to like minimize your risk, you know, cause if you're new to the game, your biggest risk is going to be buying the wrong house, but then it's also secondarily going to be hiring the wrong contractor and getting in a really bad spot. I hear these stories every day when new students come in and they've been put in a really bad spot. So if that hasn't happened to you, you know, you're very lucky and you know, you want to do everything you can to make sure it doesn't happen to you because it's something that is, uh, it, there is some risk in rehabbing, but you 
can totally control it as long as you are willing to learn some of the stuff that not everyone wants to learn. It's so cool that you guys are here and you're willing to learn this and listen to the cool stuff I'm sharing with you because so few of your competitors are willing to actually take time to learn this stuff. And I can tell you anyone I've seen over the years that does really well, they know a lot of the stuff I just taught you. They might not have the system as honed in as I have it now, but they understand construction and that's what really is important. So maybe you're ready to make a big change and get your profits more consistent and you know start making the money you're gonna deserve. So good information, glad to attend your webinar. Thanks Gary and I, I got some gift coming up for you shortly in a and A. So hang out for a bit and I'll make sure um, yeah, I'll make sure you get some cool stuff that you can use. I think it'll be helpful. I also made, uh, promised that I'd show you guys my five-step process. I hope you've seen that, standardized pricing, the rock star stuff, and really how to use powerful steps to weed out shady contractors and the next steps. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the next steps and um, the key to success. Right. There's some keys that I've learned over the years that are really important. And uh, this has been my really big thing that I hold everything in. There's really key three keys to success. It's wisdom, patience, and talent. Right. Wisdom, patience and talents. And I want you to understand what wisdom is. Wisdom is knowing the next step. Right. Having wisdom is knowing what is the next thing I need to do to be successful? What is the next thing I need to do to run an amazing business and hire contractors and find deals? When you understand that, then you have wisdom. Um, I, for many years, as much as I did, I didn't really know the next step. I was just figuring it out as I went. I hired a really amazing coach about three years ago, and that's when my life changed. And he's an e-myth coach. He was 20 years older than me, and he just brought crazy amounts of wisdom to my life and helped me understand the next steps. And patience is learning how to do it. So once you know the next step, the next thing you have to do, you got to learn how to do it because we don't know how to do everything. We're not born experts at all different subjects. And as a rehabber, there are a lot of different things you need to know. You need to learn how to find deals, market. So you got to negotiate with sellers. You got to understand some contracting, some design work, some layout stuff. You got to be a contractor. You got to know where to get the materials. You got to negotiate with people. Sometimes you got to be like a counselor. You got to hear people's problems and listen. There's a lot of little skills we have to learn, right? We have to become pretty good at some stuff and, and really, really get in. So patience is learning learning how to do it, then talent is effort and follow through. Now, I did not know this for years. I always thought we were born with talent. I always thought like, you know, some people are just smart, some people aren't. What I realized is talent is effort and follow through. Anything I've decided that I'm going to follow through with in my life, I've been considered talented at. When people see what I've done with flipping and construction, they're like, you're talented at, man. I think you're just like a natural at it. And like, you haven't seen the years I put into it. You know, I did not start out a natural. I did not start out somebody with success. I did not come from a place that people were successful with business. You know, I had to, I had to put effort and follow through, right? And the follow through is the big key. I don't know if anyone, give me a big thumbs up if anyone's had issues following through with the stuff you know you need to do. Because I can tell you for me, I've for many years knew like I need to get on a diet, lose 20 pounds. I need to really work on my construction stuff. I got to get a better system for talking to sellers. And I knew I needed all those things. The follow through is what killed me. So it wasn't until I had a coach who was talking with me every week we were working together that I started to follow through. And then I started to feel talented around construction and deal finding and all that. Right. I totally started hanging like because I realized like we can create talent. How cool is that? Like if you don't feel like you're talented at construction right now, well, guess what? You totally can be, but you're going to need some effort and you're going to need follow through. And that's where it comes in. For me, I found my follow through for whatever reason. I, I get I have a little ADD. So, you know, I like to go 18 different directions. And uh, my coach kind of reeling me in and keeping me focused every week allowed me to follow through in a big way. I'm now three years into developing this system I shared with you tonight. And three years of me doing something every week is, uh, I'll say I've never really done that, to be honest. Uh, I couldn't have done it without my coach. Uh, I hired him three, three and a half years ago. I still work with him every week now. And uh, and everybody's like, well, what are you learning from him? I'm like, well, the main thing is, he's, yeah, he teaches me, gives me awesome stuff, but he helps me follow through so I can have talent, right? Because I want to be talented as a flipper. And I can't have that talent when, you know, I'm jumping off on some other track and I'm forgetting to follow through because I, I totally don't want to follow through sometimes. Sometimes I just want to Netflix and chill and watch, you know, the blacklist or whatever other cool show it's out there, right? I got to follow through with some stuff. So how I can help. And one of the things we said, the last piece is I was going to talk about how we can help you take the next steps is my team and I have set aside 
some time to really speak with you personally about what your next steps are and how we can help. And, and as we do a call with you, we spend a little bit of time. It's free. It doesn't cost about any money at all. And you're going to get tremendous value from it because we're going to help you create a clear plan on working with contractors, finding high profit flips, wherever you're really struggling in your business. And, uh, so this, 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 really is $500 value. I have people many times have paid me for this because with mine and my coaches, with our ability to kind of dive into what you're struggling on and help you figure out a clear plan, it's really going to help move you forward in any way you do it. Now we're going to discuss like a, you know, like the simple systems you can learn to flip houses, make more income, how you can grow your business, all that stuff. And, and really how you can get consistent with your follow through. Cause I'm going to bet that there's most people in this call have not followed through in a big way. Cause I can tell you, I've not, I know it's just human nature not to follow through in a big way. Now the cost of this call is free. Um, I am only giving it to 10 people who, you know, the first 10 people who come in because me and Delante do these, he's my assistant coach. Coach, he works with us and we honestly only have so many hours because I am an active flipper. I'm not just a coach. I do coach a small mastermind. I keep it very personal so I can get great results. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm out there flipping. So I still am in the game and I have a business to run. So I can only do so much. So I want to offer that to anyone who, you know, wants to get more clarity on their business, would like to talk to me about that first and foremost. And then if they have, you know, and the reason I'm doing it, everybody's like, well, why are you giving these away? Well, I'm doing it because obviously some of you guys are going to want to coach with me and want to pay me to help you get these great results and now you got a choice you know reaching out for help is a choice doing it alone is a choice you can do it the slow hard lonely path uh, or the fast proven path and i did it many years through the slow path and i have to tell you it wasn't until i got on the fast smart proven path working with a coach and someone to teach me this stuff that I was able to really grow the kind of business that I want and really get control over a lot of things. Now, I do want to be upfront with everyone. Um, it's not for you. Like there are some people, we're very selective. This group is super small. I'm not running a big coaching program. I'm not running like, you know, buy my 199 or my boot camp. Like we work with people very personally and we keep it very small and intimate so we can help people get great results. So if you like, you know, overpaying contractors and you think you got it all figured out, you love, enjoy arguing with contractors and, and you know, spending all your time chasing them around, then this probably won't be a good fit for you because it really is only for a select few people. Now, if you're currently flipping houses or you're serious about doing your first flip and you're willing and able to invest in your business, then this is the kind of stuff you want to get on this call with us because um, this is something that really going to help you get a lot of clarity and it is invaluable to have this level of clarity. And I say invest in your business because I will tell you that if you're completely broke and you don't have money to eat, it is not like you hear you you can get into flipping with no money and the answer is you can actually use a lot of other people's money but you'll need some money to start your business you're gonna need a little money to hire a coach a little money maybe to do some marketing maybe you know get some gas to go see some houses you're gonna need a little bit of money so if you're struggling to eat you're completely broke you got no money then I would recommend before you get into house flipping Go get a job and get some consistent income so you can pay your bills, save up a little bit of money, and then you can have your little stake, right? You got to have a little bit of stake to get into the poker game. You can't come in for free. I will tell you this. Uh, construction and this whole flipping thing is about the cheapest thing you can get into for the money you make in return. You know, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you buy a subway, it's like a hundred K investment to make like 50 K a year making subs for people. And, uh, you don't need a hundred K to get in this business. I got into this business with $7,600 that I put on four credit cards because my first coach 10 years ago, I was completely broke. 100K in debt. He showed me how to call my credit card companies and get extensions to the tune of 7,600 bucks. And that's what I paid him to coach me. We worked together for a year. Now his coaching was 15K. So I paid him 7,600 down and a couple hundred bucks a month. But I had for like two years tried to figure out how to do this. I tried and failed, tried and failed. And then I actually went and figured out like with him within five weeks, I got my first deal and made 16 K on a wholesale deal. And then next year after that, I did 12 more deals and I was able to quit my full-time job and get into this. And uh, 10 years later, I'm here on the conversation with you. So I'm so glad that he showed me how to really stand for myself and invest in myself, but I did need a little money. Okay. So if I'd have been completely broke, that never would have happened for me. So I'm glad that I, I, you know, I took the risk of, you know, figuring out how to get some money to invest in my business. So I'm not saying this to say you got to be rich because you certainly don't, but you got to have a little bit of money and we always have to make sure we have a roof over our head. We have protection. We're safe. So we got to be able to eat first before we can follow our dreams. Once we got all that going, then we can start to follow our dreams. So for anyone who's willing and ready to start managing and finding the right contractors with a finished fast and on budget with a proven process, 
us, there's a link that we're going to pop up. You can see it at the end of the slide here. Click that link, schedule. There's going to be a couple things you go through. We're going to jump right into the Q&A. Uh, we're going to jump into just like, you know, basically. So a lot of times people ask me why I'm doing it. Uh, I don't want to skip this. Uh, I love this saying and I really believe in it. If you have, uh, if you can get, let me make sure I get it right. You can have everything you want in life if you only help enough other people get what they want in life. So um, I really live by that. And I will tell you the reason I think I've been so successful at this is because for the years, I've always been willing to help and share, get back for free, like these seminars, and uh, just help people, coach people very affordably, give them my personal time. Um, you know, I really believe in giving back because I, then I get what I want to. And it's a win-win for all of us. So if you guys want, you know, to help you, and uh, you think it's a good fit, then let's have that conversation. Um, again, this won't be a crazy sales call. We're going to really focus on your business and getting you some results. And if you'd like us to help, fine. If not, that's totally cool too. Okay. We totally just appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, you know, really get to dive into what you got going on. What you can expect in this call is that we're going to really figure out where you are now, where you'd like to be, remove all the obstacles to accelerate your path. And then, you know, what other things, you know, people have done to create success. So that way you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just got to follow what other people are doing, high level flippers. And then also we're going to talk about how to get your houses finished on time, started on budget, you know, how to stop relying on contractors so you can estimate your own repairs and how to increase your profits on all your flips. So you can start learning, you know, how to do all the cool stuff that we just talked about tonight. So you can have complete control of your business. Now this call is for rapid breakthrough. So spaces are limited. I told you it's only 10 people because I, I just, my schedule doesn't allow for more, unfortunately. And you know, so sign up and book your spot. Now the calendar links right here. Um, you have two things you'll need to do. We'll want you to put a questionnaire in so I can, uh, I can see what you got going on so that before we get on the call, I want to hit the ground running and make sure we maximize our time together. Uh, cause we want you to get the most from the call. So if you put the questionnaire in, once you complete the questionnaire, it's going to allow you then to book a time. It's going to put you right into our calendar and you can book a time totally free. It takes about 45 minutes. Uh, our call. So what will happen is we'll do our strategy call about 45 minutes. You're going to leave there with some really awesome stuff. Uh, at the end of the call, if you're like, hey, Mike, I'd like you to help me with this. We'll talk to you about what we got going on, our group and what's cool. And um, totally, if not, that's fine, too, because we often only have one or two spots in our group because we keep it so small. It stays kind of booked up most of the time. You know, because, uh, you know, we love helping and we just want to help on a small scale. However, when we get to talk to 10 of you, then we're going to help 10 people. Uh, unfortunately, we'll only be able to take one or two of you guys in. Uh, hopefully, it'll be, you know, whoever wants to be in. It usually works out perfectly. So what's going to happen next? Like I said, you fill out the questionnaire, you go in there, book the calendar, put the time, and then you're good to go, right? So now we're at the Q&A. Remember I said this is going to be the important part. Who has some questions they want to ask the q and I want to make sure that any before we leave, I want to make sure everyone has questions. We're answering them. See, this is where some of your biggest money's made when you're able to ask someone who's been doing this for a long time. You know exactly what do you do so uh, Matthew said for HVAC how do you standardize your systems your different BTUs your Sears your ratings so Matthew we focus on for flips we don't get as much into the Sears and the BTUs we just buy the cheapest one for a flip so if it's a house that's 14 1500 square feet then that house can do a two and a half ton unit we'll get the cheapest one it's usually Goodman or some random name I've never heard of and uh, you know, that material for an HVAC system is usually going to run right around like 1900 bucks. That's going to be for your unit, your outside unit, indoor unit, and all the copper that you need. And uh, you get that for 1900 Someone will usually charge you about 800 to to 1000 to install it. So if you need a new HVAC unit for a house that's, say, 1400 square feet, um, you're going to be looking right around like three k for that is what we pay. And now if we introduce ducts in that house, then that's about another additional three k so we're right around like 6k to do a house with ducks and an hvac unit and uh, that's standardized pricing for us so that's pretty hope that's pretty helpful for you and then uh which one can we work together plumbing oh cool which ones can work together so i mean so let me answer him next and uh, he said which ones can work together so um if you separate people you can work like right now i'll give you an example of a house that fell a little bit behind because we had some arguments with the uh, the county and the permits and uh, we had to jump in and kind of really make it happen fast so we had our sheetrock guy as the sheetrock guy was sheetrocking they were legitimately in, you know, they did their bathrooms first. They were in there doing the towel in the bathrooms. Why it was drying on the last coat, they were they were installing the trim, doors, cabinets, all that stuff. So you can stack people like crazy and you totally can get, like you generally want to start with your HVAC guy first since ducks are kind of like going to go where they go. 
but you can have that that guy in there doing the ducks and then electric and plumbing can totally can be working together. The problem is they always want to just whine a little bit and be like, hey, I don't work with this. I don't work with that. You know, we make the rules and we tell them how things are going to work because we need to get done quickly and we can't let them be petty and act like little children because if they do, that's going to cost us money. So it's our job to be like, all right, kids, right? I mean, if you got anyone on here's parents, you understand you have any teenagers or kids, you've, you've had to bring them back to, you know, reality. And that's what we have to do with our contractors. And not, I'm not trying to disrespect the contractors by any means, but sometimes they do act like children and when they're whining, complaining, and we got to get them motivated, get them on board to to want to kind of create the result that's good for all of us. Because if our flips are successful, then these contractors will be successful. And so will we see, we have success together. We're on the same path. We just, you know, we have to get them on board with that fact. And I make sure so. And Jackie says, does your estimator include materials and labor? So it's not an estimator, Jackie, just so you know, it's actually just standardized pricing. Uh, and it's going to be for labor. Uh, I don't know if materials will be in some of it, but you can usually look the materials up. So a lot of times materials are pretty easy. It is mostly for the labor piece of it because I want you to think more like um, I'm trying to control the labor cost and what people are buying so you can understand that. So if we understand standardized pricing for labor, that's important. Materials is just factual, right? So materials aren't something you can argue about. Um, I can tell you that I've had people tell me to uh, do a square roof. I've had that. Well, let me, let me give you an easier example. Um, we had someone recently, uh, one of my students, I uh, wanted to do tile in a master bath. And we usually pay about six hundred bucks, around like three, four dollars a square foot for that. Um, this person said thirty five hundred dollars, so that's pretty crazy. That's like a lot more than we normally pay. It don't even make any sense, honestly. It's so expensive. And the same person told them twenty five hundred dollars to install cabinets, which you know we normally pay about six, seven hundred bucks for. So you know we standardize it that way so we can control it because contractors are all over the place. Now, when you look at a towel, it really is based on what you pick. So, Jackie, if you pick a tile that's $2 a foot, then you'll understand the material cost. And, you know, because a lot of times you can pick different stuff. You can pick $20 a foot tile. You can pick a dollar a foot tile. So a lot of the material pricing will be a lot to do with your design and what you're picking and uh, how you're picking it to be relevant to the area you're working in. So when we do a design plan, we pretty much use it most places. But if we're in a higher end neighborhood, we upgrade that design plan. If we're in a really low end neighborhood, then we downgrade it a little bit. So we can stay very competitive to the market we're in. We don't want to over rehab and we don't want to under rehab. We really just want to nail it and hit it just right. So Jackie, I hope that's helpful for you. You guys will get to see what it is. And Steve, where are you buying your materials? Uh, so Steve, predominantly Home Depot. Uh, we love Home Depot. We've got managed accounts and all my students get to participate in that. We get to save a lot of money with them because we spend over a million and a half dollars a year. So we're getting some of the highest level discounts, but we also shop places like Lumber Liquidators. We have uh, Wood Floors Plus for flooring. We got the loading dock and uh, Southern Sales. There's little auction houses. We do what's called Called power shopping. So we always start with Home Depot because it's simplest. They'll give us free delivery. They make our lives easy. But sometimes we might see a really awesome sale at this little distributor down the street who is selling, say, subway towel for a dollar a square foot that we normally pay three dollars a square foot for. And maybe we're going to use that on our backsplash in a couple of different places. And we'll go snatch up on it because we save that money. Or if we go to Home Depot and they got a really amazing sale going on on a vanity that looks awesome. Well, we're going to jump on that and buy it. So we are always being very aware of where the best deals are because throughout a house, when you're buying materials, this is why you got to want to be your contractor because see, when you're doing this power shopping, you're saving yourself tons of money, right? And your contractor is not doing that shopping. They just don't even care, honestly, especially if you're just paying them labor and material, they'll just buy anything. So you want to be out there shopping and figuring it out. And sometimes they will cut corners that are not meant to be cut. So there's some things like if I buy a beautiful vanity that's one ninety nine, but normally it's four hundred. Um, well, I'm getting a four hundred dollar vanity for one ninety nine, but it still looks beautiful. I'll see my contractor sometime. I'll go buy one that looks like it's worth ninety nine. They pay one fifty for it. That's not what we want to do. We always want we want our we want the things to be cheap. We just don't want it to look cheap. You know, we want the value of it looking expensive, but actually being really affordable. And that's why we power shop and we use a lot of different places. So Steve, I hope that was helpful. And then Veer, you said for a person who has never flipped a house and wants to get started, 
where do you suggest that you starting and finding uh, subs and GCs? So where we talked about earlier is um, you can start with finding subs and GCs from all the different places we talked about. So we do it on Facebook groups. We do it on uh, uh, like Craigslist, uh, supply houses like Home Depot, plumbing supplies. I mean, we've got, you know, other rehabbers. You'd be surprised they'll actually share their people with you. If someone's only doing one or two houses a year, Often they're just happy to share people with you because they're not keeping them that busy. And uh, they're just like, hey, here's my guy for this. Uh, so you'll see that you, you can get a lot of the information you need. The key is that you'll be able to you'll be able to get a lot of people, but it's what you do with them when you get them is the secret. You know, how you handle them, how you interview them, how you talk with them, you know, how you present yourself as a confident person uh, will will make the difference whether people want to work with you and they're like, Oh, I like you know, Vera, I want to work with them. Yeah, they, they seem they, they know they know what they're doing. Right. And that's what you want. You want that to feel like you know what you're doing. So then Sherry, it says, are you are, are your contractors licensed? Um, so um, they don't all need to be. But I will say when it comes to like electric, plumbing and HVAC, generally, yes, they always are licensed. Uh, when it comes to general carpentry, because I'm the GC and I can be the GC, I don't have to have a licensed contractor for that. And uh, some are and some aren't. So it's just a matter of like, um, I'm the guy, I know what's going on, so I control it. And, uh, and now if you're in a different state like California, you know, maybe West Coast, there might be different laws. But in Maryland, you can, uh, you can be your own GC. And you, you only need to hire licensed people for the really important stuff like electric, plumbing, and HVAC. And that's, you know, because honestly, you don't really need a licensed person to install a door. Right, to install an interior door or a little bit of trim or put some paint on a wall. Like, you know, my nephew who's 15 can paint a house. Now, I'm not hiring him for my flips, but you get my point, right? We've, we probably all have painted a room at some point in our life and we didn't have to have a contractor's license to do that. So if I can find someone who's capable and doesn't have a license and I, I like them and I trust them and they got good character, I'm way more out to hire them because they, you know, who cares if they got a license when they're painting my house if they're good people. Now, you know, versus hiring someone who is like, I'm a licensed contractor, but I'm an awful person. And because uh, I really am more looking for character and good people. Now, when it comes to the tricky stuff, I want to make sure they have a license because in general, they'll need to have one. And we want to make sure the house is going to burn down. We're not going to have any major problems, but you can only do so much damage with paint. So things like that, I'm not as particular about. Now it says, I understand uh, itemize, uh, itemizing and breaking down the rehab. How do you accurately estimate costs? You cannot see home inspections only go so far in a house there. There may be things behind the walls, the floors, underground, even not uh, predictable until either way, the demo and problems. So Brian, that's a good question. I've heard a lot of people talk about that. And um, my, so first thing I do, honestly, is I, and all my budgets, I throw in contingencies, generally 10%. If the house is really old, I might go as high as 15% if it's a very old kind of beat up house. Um, with that being said, there's a lot less behind walls than you might expect. Um, a lot of the behind the wall stuff is actually a contractor tactic they use to change order you to death. Um, it's a, I've seen it. I've studied it. I know exactly what they do. They're always like, well, you know, this price is based on what we see. And as soon as they pull something out, they go, ah, I found, found like two bees behind the wall and that's going to be another 8,200 bucks and they have this and that. They just start finding things and because they're looking for things to change order you on to take your 50K to 65K that they originally wanted to charge you. Um, when you actually are controlling all the costs, what you'll find is like some of the things you'll find behind the walls. I'll give you some examples of some of the things I found behind the walls. You might find that you have some termite damage. And uh, ultimately, it sounds pretty bad, but you know, usually it's a little bit of framing. Maybe it's a thousand bucks. Maybe it's even fifteen hundred. But if you got a fifty k budget and you got five k sitting in there as a contingency, if you run into it, you'll be protected and you'll have the money. Uh, you generally like underground and all that. You know, if you don't see any signs, most things are have a hard time. If you have foundation issues, you'll see those. Um, there's just no real big stuff that's under. It's usually like termite damage, some framing stuff you don't always see. Sometimes you'll find knob and tube wiring behind the wall. Uh, but often if we get in the basement, we dig in and we look, we can usually find signs of that. So it is very easy once you understand construction to predict a lot of the things that contractors don't like to predict. See, they love not predicting it. They love giving you estimates that are loose and fast so they can come back and change it because see they want to win and if they're going out and saying you know byron i can do this for 50 and then they know in the back of their head they're going to beat everyone now at 50 and they're basically going to you know tell you what you want and then tell you what you're actually going to pay later once they start finding reasons to change order you so i really don't allow change orders i tell people when they give me a price 
like, hey, I want you to include anything that might come up too. So I can, that's how I handle a lot of the behind the wall stuff. Uh, with that being said, I can't, you know, I'm not always going to win 100% on all that. So Jackie, thank you so much. And I appreciate it, man. Uh, can't complete a questionnaire. Um, um, no, no, why, but, uh, can you try again? Because ultimately it should be fine. Um, you have the link. If you can go back, maybe, uh, check it, maybe like 10 minutes. Maybe it's too many people on at one time. Uh, and then last we'll go with Matthew and let's just make sure I'm not missing anyone. It's really big. Matthew said, uh, spot on on the order of importance mechanics. I do three HVAC, plumbing, electrical. Many people don't understand time saved doing the things. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, Matthew. It's actually true. Um, guess I can't hear. I just stopped. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me now. And uh, thanks for the response. Uh, everyone insured workman's comp. Uh, yeah, some, you know, you can get workman's comp for your people or they can have it too. There's sometimes I get people that are so affordable and so awesome that I might pay for the workman's comp for them. And there is, if it's just one person, they can actually do a workman's comp waiver. So we have a lot of different stuff. And you know, laws aside, are you requiring your contractors to pull permits and get required inspections? And uh, do you allow them to work without permits or can you get away with it? And I'm not against permits, uh, but I'm against the time and, the pettiness of the inspectors. Well, Rob, me and you are like soulmates, my friend. <laughs> so am I. I freaking, it, listen, uh, I pull permits when I think I can't get away with it. And sometimes I don't. If I'm doing a you know quick 30, 40K renovation and it's in a county that's really kind of laid back about permits, I'm probably not going to pull permits. But if I'm in the middle of Baltimore and, you know, Federal Hill or by the water where I know people are going to be really pumped about it, then I tend to pull permits. So I'm really just looking at it as an equation. You know, if I get caught, what's going to be the downside for me? Now, with that being said, I do have a little caveat to that. You know, when I tell people I don't pull permits, they're always like, really? You don't pull? And when I say I don't, I only I don't pull on some and I do pull on others. Uh, but I'm doing that as a strategic risk. I understand the risk behind it. So I'm able to you know, mitigate that risk. But with that being said, I always do things to code in case I get caught. Because my experience has been if I do it to code when I get caught, then everything's pretty cool because I can easily just get the permits, work it out. It's not that big a deal. The inspectors tend to be more friendly if the work looks good. If the work's really shoddy and cut in corners, then the inspectors are really hard on you. So I make sure everything's done to code, but you're right, Rob. I don't like the pettiness and dealing with them. So if I think I can get away with it, it's just a, it's a business decision for me. I know some people that always pull permits and I know some people that never pull permits. Totally cool, whatever you decide to do. I've done it both ways, and it really is just about you guys doing whatever you think's right. Okay, let's make sure we don't know. It says, what type of permits should I always pull when doing a rehab? Again, I think I answered that question just there. It's totally up to you, Dave. Um, you don't have to always pull anything, but if you were going to focus, like if you pull one permit, you kind of have to pull them all. So if you pull electric, you kind of have to pull plumbing, HVAC, and whatever else. Because once one permit guy is in there, he's going to generally see that you didn't pull permits on other stuff. So uh, you kind of have to pull all or nothing. Totally up to you. And let's see, all right, makes sense. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Very, uh, really excited to see the gift in general. Okay, let me get to that. I'm going to get to that right now. Vera, thank you for waiting. Thanks everyone for being patient. Here's the link and, uh, let's see if we can get some, some help to post this link up so everyone can join this link and, uh, you can download it and, you know, take it in and we'll make sure you have it. I'm also going to send everyone who attended an email where your link's in it, a replay, and I'll make sure you have everything you need, okay? Just in case you don't get it tonight. And uh, if you're anyone else who, if you're having any issues with uh, any getting on there, come on. And uh, even if it's booked out and the 10 spots are up and somehow you couldn't get through, feel free to send me a message or anything. Say, hey, I tried to book, the system didn't work. Because sometimes when too many people do it at once, you know, and a lot of people jump in and, you know, really want to grab those 10 strategy sessions uh, before they run out. Uh, but if somehow you missed out one because, you know, the, the equipment wasn't working, feel free to text me. We'll figure it out. It will squeeze it in. I really appreciate everyone spending the time and I hope everyone got a lot of value from this because it was our hopes that you get tremendous value and you can really start to shift your beliefs around construction, flipping, you know, what's possible even, right? What is possible out there? Can you make money? Can you take control of this? Can you get back to being like in charge of your business, your life and your flips, all that you can. And if you're new and you haven't done a flip, then know this is how you should be doing it. And so few people are going to tell you this. There's so many gurus over the years that taught me all the wrong ways and pushed me into what I call like the, the snake pit where I couldn't make any money and I was driving myself crazy. So 
Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. And uh, email, please. I'm in. So yes, I'll make sure you get the email. It's uh, going to come out to everyone who attended. So you'll have it. And do you always supply the HVAC equipment? No, actually, I don't most of the time, Matthew. Uh, Matthew's like, let's go back to Q&A. I got more questions. I like Matthew. He's like me, man. I got a lot of questions, too. I always love asking and finding out. And I, I don't mind asking, uh, answering for you. No, um, so I can supply it. Um, generally, most of my best guys, they supply it for me, and they know. They work with rehabbers. So a lot of the best HVAC guys um, aren't just people who work for retail people. They predominantly specialize in working with flippers. I had one guy, um, and he's not around anymore because I think he was too cheap, but he would put in – ducks and everything for 4,500 bucks. And uh, everyone, when we heard he did it for that price, everyone was like, how does he do it so cheap? Well, when I had a conversation with him, he told me he was doing it that cheap because he was working from here to New Jersey with like, uh, like I don't know, a couple hundred flippers. And he was literally doing like 1,100 units a year with different flippers. So he was definitely a volume guy. Now, 4,500 was too cheap. He definitely wasn't making any money and it wasn't good. But you know, he understood and then eventually he disappeared. I think he probably burnt out and I got someone now that does it for like 5,500 and I'm more than happy. I'm happy to pay 55 really good stuff. So, so let's see what else we got real quick. And I've uh, got Maria welcome since when it comes time to sell, uh, it might come back to bite you if you don't pull permits and uh, might disclose your requirement. It might be due diligence. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Maria, all good points. And that is a, a calculated risk you have to consider when you decide to either pull or not pull permits. Um, yes, somebody might get upset that you didn't pull them. In my experience, Maria, what I've uh, been seeing, because uh, obviously there's some houses I don't pull, if an agent is um, like, hey, you didn't pull permits, we don't want your house, I'm usually able to work through that and say, hey, why don't you get a home inspection? Uh, if anything, don't look up the par. Because I'm like I said, I, if I don't pull permits, I make sure the work is done really well. And uh, so if they, you know, if they come to me and say, hey, you didn't pull permits and we want you to, um, I'm often in a multiple offer situation. Almost every one of my flips sells really quickly. It gets multiple offers. So I'm in a very abundant position where I could just be like, hey, you know, we totally understand if you don't want to buy the house, totally cool. Most people will agree just to do the home inspection and allow us to do any repairs to make sure they're comfortable with everything. So uh, if they're doing it that way, then, you know, we often can work around that, Maria. But yes, it could bite you in the butt. There is always risk risk when you cut you know you do something that's not like to the by the rules but we are always weighing risk versus reward in everything we do in life so uh, i won't teach or tell anyone to do it one way or the other uh, that is a business decision that only you can do i will tell you that um you know obviously i've gotten pretty smart about when it makes sense and when it doesn't and uh, you know if i'm in an area where people are going to be really picky uh, and they're going to really make sure they want permits i'm probably going to make sure i do it every single time and in some areas, they're just like, who cares? You know, I love the house. Look how cool that granite is. First time home buyers are really happy. And then their inspector comes through and he's like, yeah, you did a great job. Place is clean, looks better than most of the other flips. Um, you're good to go usually. So again, this is something you'll have to decide you know, when you, you know, you decide to get in. I teach pooling permits and doing all it the right way. I have some students that are like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to take this risk because I know I won't get caught that much. And I'm okay with that. I mean, it's their, their business and their decision to make. So, uh, you know, I support either way. Uh, so obviously what I don't support is doing crappy work or doing anything to cut a corner. And I love when I think it was Matthew, right? I think when he said like, I hate the pettiness of the inspectors, most of us are not doing this to cut corners or be chintzy or do crappy work. We're really doing great work, the same as if we pull permits, but we're doing it so we don't have to deal with the inspectors and we can cut our timeline down because the inspectors can be like really petty. Matthew, you got it exactly right. Uh, if you're Matthew, you're one that said it, I believe you were. Um, they just are petty. Like you'll, they'll tell you one month, do this, and next month they'll come in and say, do that. Like, you know, like I said, totally different than what you said last month. And they just make the process a little painful. So, you know, for some people, and again, I'm just using, giving an example, some people decide not to. So I have no idea how to view the link that's posted. Uh, okay, Dave, so let's uh, clip it out. You know what I'll do? I'll make sure that every one of you guys get an email. And uh, that way, you know, for anyone who is a technical, not a technical genius like me, um, I'll make sure you get what you need, okay? I'll make sure everyone gets an email. It, it, you should have it tonight or first thing tomorrow, okay? Is that fair? And I really appreciate it. You guys have been on this time for almost two hours and uh, I hope we got some really good stuff. I'll make sure you get your gift. I'll make sure you get a replay if you need it. And also if there's any strategy sessions, you want to jump in, make sure you pull and you jump in. I look really forward to talking to whoever's uh, done a strategy session and we're going to get in some really awesome stuff. So thanks G Daniel, Nay, uh, Matthew, Amin, Charles, Veer, 
uh, Maria, Cheryl, Matthew, Dave, uh, all you guys, Byron, thanks so much, Rob, and Dave again, and Steve, and Guest, I don't know your name, but thank you, and I hope you're hearing, and if not, you'll get a replay, and uh, Matthew, and Jackie, hopefully you're still around, and Sherry, everyone, thanks so much, I appreciate your time, and uh, I'll make sure everyone gets an email for the replay, okay? Have a great evening, good day, and start following your dreams, and you know, make this rehabbing thing happen, it's one of the greatest things. You can start really changing the world with the money you make and the lives that you change won't just be your own, but it'll be a lot of people around you. So everyone have a great day and I really appreciate your time uh, being on this training.